I'm going to begin uh, welcoming you. I'm Jerry Miller. If we haven't met, this is Mark McGahey. We're going to hello everyone. We're going to talk you through the the UIL state training, and we're going to begin with with just an introduction. I thought the first thing we could do is kick it over to uh, a short video clip uh, from Dr. Kent. So uh, here's a little bit from Dr. Kent. Hello, my name is Brad Kent, and I serve as state director of music for the University Interscholastic League. On behalf of the thousands of marching band students across the state of Texas. Thank you for your willingness to serve as a UIL area or state marching band contest adjudicator. These events are paramount in the lives of students, directors, parents, and communities across Texas. The success of these competitions is largely dependent upon the quality of adjudication and the consistent application of the UIL area state adjudication system. The information you are about to receive is intended to provide you with the best possible training to in turn enable you to provide the highest quality evaluations for our bands. This adjudication system was conceived by Texas band directors and developed through multiple years of study and testing and is designed to maintain an emphasis on achievement in the areas of music and visual performance, all while reinforcing the educational priorities that are valued in our state. This training will guide you through a review of the key components of the UIL scoring system with an emphasis on points management and the development of purposeful evaluations. Instructions will emphasize the effective use of the area state adjudication rubrics or placemats as we call them to score and rank the participating bands. In closing, I would like to thank TMAA and specifically Jerry Miller and Mark McGahey for the development of this wonderful tool to aid in providing the best possible adjudication experience for marching bands in Texas. Again, thank you for your service as a UIL judge. We hope that you find this training to be educational, informative, and useful as you prepare to adjudicate the contest. All right. Well, that was a great intro from, from Dr. Kent. I, I wanted, you know, Mark kind of started this process about the new sheets, and I thought it'd be a good chance for him, to, for those of you who are just kind of stepping into this or, or knowing about it, to, about what our process has been over the last several years. Sure. Jerry, I'm real excited to see this. For those of you that don't know, in December of 2017, which seems like light years away uh, from uh, when we began this, we actually started conversations about what can we do to progress the evaluation tools for the, uh, the incredible marching bands in the state of Texas. And so with that became ideas. We decided to, to create a committee that had the entire state represented from classifications to regions to uh, uh, styles. We try to come up with the, the biggest cross sections we can. So thank you. If you're a committee member that joined us on that one, those 13 or 14 people, thank you again because you, you have been pioneers to help put this new evaluation tool together. We uh, met at TBA. We met at TMEA every, uh, every convention. We would go back to the drawing board. And, and we would come up with ideas. There was a survey sent out, so we would come up with models. We would send it out to the, um, the membership of uh, the, the Texas band directors, and so they would see if it was vetted. And we were loving to see that 75, 80% of the directors were liking the direction it was going. We'd go back to the drawing board, the workshop, and try to make it a little bit better. And then, of course, we were able to go through the processes of getting something passed in the UIL uh, music division. And we had it ready to go. We just felt like last fall was obviously not the fall to let that happen because of numerous reasons. Uh, but we have been able to sit on this. So the, the, uh, the sheets are only as strong as the training and especially as you as, as adjudicators for that, that group that's watching today, how we're going to be able to implement these. So this is a key component that I never thought we'd be able to see this day, but we're finally getting to that point really soon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our lights just went out because of the uh, motion. One of us needs to stand up and go walk <laughs> around a little bit. You want to do that and I'll dive into this? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Well, maybe we can fix that one, too. Um, so uh, as we dive right in, let's talk about the guidelines for judging uh, marching band. Hey, we're back. Um, the, the adjudication for all groups should be based solely on the performance of the day. That's an important point, and I might say that that's on a quiz coming up, but that the adjudication of all groups should be based on the performance of the day. I want to stress, and I know Mark will agree with me on this one, but be consistent. If you miss one, just start over. It's, don't 
find yourself down this rabbit hole of, of you gave us one score and, and it's really a struggle to kind of get your way back. If you miss one, just start over. And the good news is you can always have a conversation with that area executive, uh, with that state level executive about moving that back or, or kind of walking that back and trying to help. But we all make mistakes and we understand that. We would rather have one mistake um, than one mistake compounded into 15 or 20 mistakes. Um, I would advise you, and especially at the area, m more so than the region round, the area and the state round, um, please refrain from talking uh, to other judges until you've marked your rating for the band. Um, I think that's another one when they see us talking to each other and then going back and writing. I think that that's just, again, some simple judging norms that I think um, are real important. The, the optics on that, it looks like that there's people that are coercing or able to try to come up with a, let's get this group in, and we really know that's not the case. Uh, you, we, you feel you're insecure about it, go back to your sheet, go back to your notes. You are the hired expert, so trust your opinion. Afterwards, it's okay to have some healthy discussion about some things, but of course, anything where it gives the optics that we are trying to create a certain scenario with the, the, uh, the contest that day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, remember that we have five divisions at the region level, but even through to area and state, everything we'll talk about today, you'll see is divided into those five divisions. And using that rubric or that placemat, and we'll talk a lot about placemats today, in your adjudication is really important. It's really valuable, I think, to the groups that we justify what we say uh, on that rubric and that placemat. We've all had that marching band scenario where you get the recording before you see the, the number. Mm -hmm. And you go, oh, this judge definitely has us way up and then you see the number and you kind of scratch your head and go oh wow that's vice versa we've had the scenario where the the, the recording's pretty rough and the score comes back stronger than you thought ideally they should listen to it and with scoring specific language hear what you say and go oh that matches exactly and that's what we want um, it's so important that we write clearly um, so that our comments are readable and, and I always say write as if an administrator is going to read it write as if that print they, the band director hands it to their principal and says here's how we did it area but also write as if a student will read it because many band directors do. I know I, I'm one, you know, post it up on the board yes, and let sure. the kids see see what's there. Anything on, on those points? Yeah, I, 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 you are a part of the educational process and think about the curriculum uh, that's that's been here. What great to, uh, opportunity to give some feedback to those students while still fresh on their mind. They're still, it's pro, pretty vibrant about how that performance went to get reaffirmation or, you know, we're close and here's some areas that we're going to keep working on. And I, I love that we have this opportunity. Let's don't miss that and let's create that uh, scenario. We continue the education even after the contest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I kind of already said that first one, but uh, address the appropriate descriptors. We want you to stay in caption. I, I don't want you to be in that uncomfortable thing as a music judge where you end up. I mean, it's okay that the visual will impact the music, but making sure that all your comments are, are very music focused. Um, scoring specific language, and we're going to hear a lot about that today. And so if you're not familiar with that term, but it, it's about using the, the words that are on the sheet. Um, words like consistently, words like usually and always, that, that those words make their way into your recorded commentary so that the, the, from, from a listening perspective that they understand this group you know, is where they are based on the language I use during the performance, not that I came up with an arbitrary score after. I'll always remind you, you know, the mobile phone thing is, is a problem. You know, having that phone just out of the way where it doesn't even look like you're glancing down at it. And I know sometimes you're managing things and maybe there's a babysitter at home with the kids. Maybe there's, you know, all of those things that you're having to watch. But you know, I think just be conscious of, like, like Mark was saying about talking in between the groups, just the optics on that are, are, can be challenging. On the, on the latter point, sometimes having an iPad set up, like you're trying to come up with a way to keep a spreadsheet under, uh, going at the same time. Probably not on your phone is probably people would assume associate that more with your discussing something with someone. Mm -hmm. The iPad could be a setup where you actually have the spreadsheet on that one. The, the uh, scoring specific language, I, I do remember in some of our ad hoc study committee, we, we would, these words are very intentional. We spent an hour talking about why it's to say usually and not say sometimes. Yeah. And we were going through all of the points and the pros and cons. So there's been a lot of work put in this. Nothing is perfect, but we feel we've set you up to be successful with the language that gives you the most broad base opportunities for comment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, a few more things. There's no official style for marching band in Texas. Every group has a unique identity. It's a, you know, a, a, a core style band versus a military band versus a show band. All groups have an opportunity for the highest level of success. Our role as adjudicators is to recognize, to measure, and to reward, to speak to what's being achieved. Um, I also feel like sometimes 
directors or, or judges, I should say, may feel like we need to, to watch the rules of the contest. That's what our, our amazing area executives and, and same at the state level, let those folks worry about the rules. If you observe something, you can let them know, but we don't need that reflected in your score um, or anything like that. If you observe something that you feel like is outside the bounds of the rules, and that's totally appropriate to, to call in and report. Um, but at the same time, we want to keep that free of our commentary because those rules things, you know, th there could be more to the story th than we know getting into that. Um, let's go on. Remember that we're all, I, I think we've all come into this business as teachers first. Um, I don't think any of us came out of college and were immediately hired to judge the state marching right. contest. I think we all kind of earned our keep and made our way through that. And so remember that we're teaching, and, and that teacher language is what got you to where you are and that ability to be a great teacher um, got you to the level where you're being asked to judge an area or a state contest. Um, everything we write and say should positively enrich these young people. Um, our primary concern is the welfare and growth of these students. Anything else on this? The, we're not going to cover it today, but there's a, it's a great uh, paper that I'm reminded of in the pageantry arts that talks about teacher, counselor, and critic, mm -hmm. that our role is we're, we're uh, trying to educate uh, our young teachers, our experienced teachers, the ones that are pushing innovation, and we're able to guide them along the way. It is hard to recognize those ensembles right off the bat, but you do get a strong impression of them where here is exactly what they need. Never should we be in a scolding matter, or I told you so, but we're just guiding to say, here's some, some questions and it's even down to is that the way you would like that to look is yeah. that the way you want that to sound if that is that's a choice and you just kind of raise some really cool questions along the way when when you let the uh, the uh, performance come to you and I think you have a great opportunity about how that we can really guide the teaching of the, the teachers yeah, yeah yeah absolutely so let's talk about a little bit again kind of staying in this judge we're gonna again invest probably the first 30 minutes of our training or so talking about this but a little bit of before during and after you judge and I know for those of you who are veteran judges this is maybe just some helpful reminders for those of you and I know we have some of you this is your first time judging area and that's exciting first time judging state uh, we want to make sure that we talk just about some some important procedures the first is familiarize yourself with your surroundings um, make sure that if you need to make allowances because you're kind of way off to the side the warm-up area is right behind you and it's kind of loud like all of those things familiarize yourself with your surroundings make sure your recorder works we're the only division of UIL where the recording is so 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 important um, you know in, in concert and sight reading you get a, a written sheet but there's no recording to go with it and so our recorded commentary is is oftentimes what directors lean on more so than our sheets with that being said make sure that your recorder works Always begin by identifying yourself in the contest. You know, begin with your name, and we're at area prelims, we're at state finals, I'm gonna be adjudicating music, I'm gonna be adjudicating percussion, and then any field references that you feel might help the group, especially at the area level, to say, I'm on side one, because if you're judging music and you're hearing a lot of balanced concerns, that and the, the judge over on side two isn't noticing, they may need to make some adjustments to how things are, are staged and or just performed from that level. Anything on those? I, I, you may be covering this later in a later slide, but I, I do think about about like uh, the materials I take when I go judge and we are evolving a lot more to technology uh, I still think it's great to have in your backpack here's a notebook here's a way to take notes you do need to have a little uh, area that you could type you know uh, blue and black uniforms the show had this in it they moved really well uh, could have sounded better wow they performed really well looking forward to see them in finals anything you can have a reference point because at the end of a long day you have to have a, a way to do that I also think about where I put those materials on where I'm judging sometimes I'm standing up and I'm having to look over the uh, the edge of the, um, the the press box or sometimes I'm in a, in a seated position how am I going to arrange those materials so I can be as efficient as possible so I'm not searching for th uh, things each time but uh, having a plan uh, while you get situated in addition to noticing your surroundings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well said. Some other things. Um, your recorded and written commentary should provide accountability for evaluation, criticism, and useful information. Additionally, the approach of the tone of the commentary needs to be helpful and geared towards student listening as well. I know sometimes we can get kind of off on a tangent, a pet peeve, something that bothers us, be sure that we're always thinking about this needs to, to be to the students as well. Again, just like I mentioned, many directors post the sheets on the board for their students to listen to or to, to view. I think a lot of them play the recordings or share them so, yeah. with their students. Um, and judge the totality of the show. And we're going to get into this a little bit later, but making sure that rather than just a first impression or something that bothers you in the first minute, I'll kind of cough, cough, electronics, cough, cough, um, you know, make sure that you say what you need to say and move on. Um, it, we need to judge the totality of the performance and not let one pet peeve just stick in us 
um, the, the whole time we're, we're doing that. I'll finish these last two. And sure. it, it's okay. Um, keep in mind that the recording is the primary method of communication and how we say it is as important as what we say. The, th this one comes a little bit with experience, but uh, in addition to not letting a, a pet peeve or even a comment about excellence, uh, you need to let the performance breathe a little bit. Mm. Sometimes we just want to keep filling uh, air, air, dead airspace <laughs> along the way. I'm guilty of that too. That yes, I recognize this. Yes, I recognize this. It's okay to not have to comment about every phrase of music. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a chance to listen. It's really good that you are uh, letting something happen, giving your observation about it, giving your impression, but make sure you're not talking over another key moment, especially if you know what's coming up in the show. And that that is a little bit of practicing you have to mm -hmm. learn to do, where you can still get the idea across without just being redundant on the next phrase of music. And yeah, be looking for the frequency also. Absolutely. Um. Oh, see, there's my first one. It's not easy to listen while talking. There you go. Um, during the performance, keeping your comments succinct. And um, remember that we don't have that long until the next band's performance. So just kind of get going and, and say, be succinct. Um, the words we use need to match the descriptors. I've kind of harped on that a little bit today. And some directors make judgments about the quality of recorded remarks based on one disagreeable thing. So, you know, I think it's, again, it's important for us to try and judge the totality of the performance, find good things find areas for growth that's that's our task lastly i'll say on those longer area days and i'm especially thinking about area and, and some of the state prelims it's a long day um be sure that we're not changing our approach over the course of the day where we're maybe getting impatient or frustrated with a particular issue that we keep seeing over and over again each group gets a fresh set of eyes each group gets a fresh set of ears every single time they come up uh if it's four groups in a row that have had some kind of electronics issue, it's still their first time. And mm -hmm. it's not like, I just told you, Zach, you know, you told the other three groups, you didn't tell them. <laughs> so it's okay to start fresh and give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And it's okay to kind of give your explanation along the way about, hey, you might want to consider this off the bat, that it's a little bit out of balance in this particular stadium because it's empty because of your placement, that it's out of balance with the acoustical uh, instruments that are being played, for instance. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, formulate a score that reflects, reflects that appraisal. And, and I'll just say, we're thinking about historical norms inside the classification. And so if you're judging a class that you haven't seen before, let YouTube be your guide. You know, if you're, if you're judging, let's say, 2A state prelims, and, and you go, you know, I, I don't really, I've not taught at the 2A level, maybe I've taught 4A, 5A, I, I need to go back and sit, then, then watch some 2A bands. I, I mean, I guarantee there's a lot of good links on YouTube of groups that have been at that level and, and groups developmentally that are there to help you understand historical norms um, within our state inside that classification. And of course, uh, using the placemat is, uh, is going to be your friend going forward. If you're out of, out of state, you can go to the UIL website, UIL Music website, and find any past results just to find some general groups that have been there, not that ex exclusive or including one or not excluding any, anyone, but you can kind of get an idea of maybe some of the organizations for different classes if you're not as familiar with uh, those in Texas. Yeah. Be as informed as, and current as you can. Listen to recordings of your band. Um, when, when people judge and you're like, wow, this person was really good, listen to that recording and notice what's good about it. Uh, practice with your own band, uh, whether you do it in a video format or if you're able to do it live at a, maybe a Thursday run through, maybe a Friday football game, grab your phone and make a recording for your own group. Uh, and then we're going to we're, so we're talking about this before we started the broadcast. We'd like to begin building some good UIL exemplars for you as we get into these new sheets to say, here, let's listen to Mark doing a recording for this group. And, and you can begin from there, I think, to even have um, a better sense of what that can sound like and be. Um, I think that listening to and watching other formats is really useful. The, the BOA, DCI, WGI folks, um, you can learn a lot there. And have an open mind. There are different philosophies and different ways, and, and making sure that we're open to that I think is so important. Yeah, I'm looking forward to with this uh, starting point in technology. You know, we have those other organizations, but now we'll have our current sheets, current uh, descriptors, and a, we, we think this incredible panel set up that we're already looking forward to having some exemplar uh, recordings based off of the uh, area and the state contests that are coming up. Yeah. yeah. So let's do just a quick, this will be a real quick breeze through on ethics, but I want to make sure that we're all clear on this. We covered this with the region judges. So if you're a TMAA, uh, which almost everyone is, uh, you know, as, as I look down the list, um, you've covered this, but it's maybe just a good thing for us to do a quick review. Now that you know your area assignment, you know your state assignment, you can begin to think through, 
okay, I'm clear on this or I'm doing this and am I going to be okay? So let's just, um, let's you and I talk through a, a few of them. Mm-hmm. The first is as an, from an affiliation perspective that um, you can't be associated with a group that you are judging. A formal affiliation would be that you were very recently the head director and assistant director. You write their drill. You arrange their music. You do their show design. The UIL executive secretary can help you with this, but if you feel like you're not that, but if you have an affiliation with a group you're going to be seeing, we need to make sure we have that conversation. What if I'm asked to, uh, hey, can you just kind of run a pre-UIL kind of recording for that group? Would that affect that affiliation? Right. And so you can judge groups. Uh, you can judge groups and, and you're still clear on the affiliation. The trick is if you do a clinic. Mm-hmm. If, if after the group performs, you go down to the field or you sit with those, you know, that's when you enter into clinic land. Sure. And once we're doing that and once we're directly impacting it past the simple making of recording, press the stop button, write a score or, or write a quick sheet and send it. But once we get into clinic land, mm-hmm. um, that, that's, I think, where we get into trouble. And again, if you have questions about that, reach out to your area executive secretary. If, if you're like, hey, I feel like there may be a gray area here, reach out. Right. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lose that assignment. It may mean that if we feel like we need to make a switch, we'll have that conversation. Yeah. So it'll be okay. Secondary affiliations. Um, if you have a family member or a personal relationship with someone who is serving in any of those capacities, again, always better to be clear. And if we need to fix something ahead of time, let's get it fixed. Um, so Trans- just let us know. Transparency is so important here. It's not a gotcha moment. We're just wanting to make sure it's the optics and, of course, moving everyone into a position where they can all uh, go ahead without any kind of uh, – anything's going to impede them along yeah. the way. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of professionalism, prior to judging, um, you can't give – and that's what we are just talking about, technical or programming advice. Um, as well, we can't show a public bias for anyone. And, boy, this is tricky on the social media front. You might see a great group that you just think is lights out amazing, and you finish judging the contest, and you say, had a great time judging with Mark McGahee today. So such and such high school was amazing. Um, right. I, I, you're entering into a bias area where you, you just it's going to be hard to dig yourself out of that. Um, and so it's best to just not express bias or opinion until after state championships are, are done. And, and here's kind of a comment to that regarding right. social media is just be aware of anything that you say is closely monitored. As judges, the perception is that you work for UIL. Um, you're, you're hired by those area executives. A lot of times you're nominated by the, the directors. You're invited to be there. At the same time, from the if you think about a mom or a dad in the stands who sees a score, sees a number, and then they happen to a friend of a friend is knows you on social media and you post it, the perception is that you're working for UIL and you're showing bias. So just be very, very mindful about that as well if you feel negatively about the way something goes. Right. Social media is not the place to say so-and-so should have won, so-and-so should have advanced. Like, again, it's the post-mortem situation. Like, we, we're not going to go back and do that either because that's not going to help further the cause. If you have concerns, then that's that's what people like Brad and Gabe are there for. The, from the TMAA side, that's where I can help you. Like, reach out to us and let us help you uh, rather than going on social media and on a tirade because that's that's never constructive. Well, and, and talk to someone who can directly affect and influence that rather than just trying to air dirty laundry. And, yeah. uh, always a good rule is when in doubt, don't. Uh, if you're not sure, don't do it. Especially, we all have seen that on social media for multi, uh, multiple themes, for yeah. sure. Yeah. When it comes to integrity, it should be understood that you have mutual respect for the opinions of others as well. If a judge, if you have a reason to question somebody that you're judging with, that's what that area executive is for. You can reach out to me from the TMAA front if it's a concern there. But just be sure that you're not getting into a tussle with that judge during the contest. Um, if you're seeing numbers, if something isn't right, if you feel like they're being unprofessional, just kind of discreetly is what I put here. Discreetly find that area executive and just say, hey, can I, can I have a quick conversation with you? I'm a little worried about so-and-so. Um, and then let, let's, let's fix it and let's support each other. Um, but at the same time, let's do it in a professional manner. When it kind of goes back to your, your earlier comment, don't try to control the contest. Yeah. You, you, you were hired to do a job that day. You can maybe bring up the topic and then let the, uh, the uh, administrators in charge handle any kind of uh, changing or evolving from there. Yeah. Last one on professionalism is just make sure that you're not being super excessive with your volume, your movement and gesturing, all of these things. Um, the performance is to be centered around the students uh, and not you as an adjudicator. So it's just a, a reminder about being professional and being discreet. We're going to do a little piece on philosophy of judging before we dive into our first quiz of the day. Um, I'm just going to kind of read this to you, and then Mark and I can reflect on it here at the end. Oh, no, Mark, we went dark again. All right, I'll read while we do this. We'll have to figure out the light timing, or we need to get around and move more. I don't know. The achievement level as displayed by the performers at a given contest shall be the sole basis 
for evaluation. Achievement results from the simultaneous considerations of content or the responsibilities given those performers and the extent to which the students perform them. Each judge must simultaneously consider the what and the how. Each band makes a wide variety of choices. The system, the UIL system, encourages and rewards bands that provide the public with a sense of engagement, a sense of entertainment. The scoring system encourages and rewards innovation and artistry in performance and design. It also rewards a carefully balanced variety of all the important facets of design and performance. When we were putting our sheets together, we kept coming back to these main mission statements, like mm -hmm. what are we trying to uh, come up with a tool that's going to get these things, these areas that will evolve, especially the entertainment, the educational part, the excellence, yeah. something that definitely rewards uh, in all the fronts. And then, yeah, the scoring system provides tools for teaching and positive criticism with the goal of improving all the programs in Texas. Lastly, proper use of the UIL scoring system will provide educational value for all. It will allow each band to project its own identity as it chooses. All the performers are worthy of recognition and dignity for their efforts. And so those three slides, I think, really sum up a lot of what our committee aimed to do. Uh, but in addition, I think what we as adjudicators aim to do, and I love the, the second to last little paragraph sentence here about uh, tools for teaching and positive criticism with the goal of improving every program. Um, that, I think, should be our aim as an adjudicator is for that program to be better that next time around. A few more things here. Each sheet is on a tiered system. I know you're aware of that, divided between the what and the how. There are no pure captions. Nothing exists in isolation. As you're talking about music, the visual, as you're talking about visual, the music can impact it. But at the same time, we need to stay within our captions. Uh, the performance of the students is of critical importance, and all programs begin with an opportunity for success. One of those last bullet points he just talked about there, the performance of the students is always of critical importance. It's the performance of the day. Mm -hmm. It's never the history of the program or the legacy of the program. Uh, that Everyone has a fair chance. It's from we push reset and we're all starting with the exact same 100 points mm -hmm. and everyone gets a chance to be rewarded on the performance of that day. Absolutely. The strengths and weaknesses measured from the start to the end, we talked about judging the whole show, and any summary that we give at the end should reflect some strengths and some areas for growth. I think that that's important, that's what directors expect. Listening and watching the entire band over the length of the show needs to offer a seamless look at the relationship between the music and visual. And it's okay, again, and I know that's sometimes a tricky divide, I'm judging music, but if you know that the visual is impacting that, be it the space on the field, the velocity, what have you, you can talk about those and then vice versa um, to have that conversation. The directors and the designers select and create the program, the staff and students bring that to life. Our major objective is to understand that the performers work not only to bring the performance to the audience, but also to bring precision to it. So it's not just about excitement, but excitement in precision. Because uh, I think that's what people really value about our activity uh, and what we're able to do. You want to say anything on that before we go into what no, and how? We're good, doing great. Great. So let's talk a little bit about the what and the how. Um, we need to focus on these two areas. What is being asked of the performers? How well are they doing it? Ideally, a judge would comment on what and follow up with how. And we're going to talk about some examples. In fact, one of the quizzes talks a little bit about what are some examples of these types of statements. We should avoid spending too much language on how things are going. We, we would refer to that in the old days as a tick tape, right? You got a recording from a judge. It's like trumpet player, 35 yard line. Uh, a color guard not together and there's miss 20. This, yeah. Miss this, not together. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, those recordings are useful, but any director can see that, that, that has a, a commensurate, especially if they've advanced to area already. They, they already know that those things are problematic. It's more a balance of the what and the how. We should avoid, as well, spending too much language on what's being asked as well, because then they feel like, well, they didn't really judge the kids. That judge only really talked to yeah. the, you know, they, they just talked to the drill writer. They talk, and, and we, so it's a balance of those things and how those two work hand in hand. Can I say something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I, I know I've grown the most as an adjudicator in recent years. Uh, with that training, with the advice I was given, uh, you're giving great comments about this. It is circle back to it and show some relevance. Uh, well, over here, the, the geographical spread that this ensemble is having to play this moment is definitely noted of how 
far, uh, far apart the performers are and how you're having to still keep the precision together and still create subtle nuances along the way. So you're recognizing that or, wow, look at the lower body responsibilities are being asked to the performers and you're still playing an overly uh, technically demanding passage. So you're, you're recognizing that and I know that as instructors and band directors, it's like, they don't get it. They just don't get it. It's <laughs> yeah. like, no, no, we actually do. We see that you're, you're, you put so much into this. You're getting credit for uh, that portion of the sheet. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, on the other side, how the students are really bringing that to life. Yeah, yeah. The intent on those bullet points in the front, too, is to help provide you with uh, a framework to talk about that. And that continues on the back with those questions. And so I think the more that we can refer to those, so we can reflect on those, um, the stronger we're going to be t when it comes to a balanced mm -hmm. set of commentary. And so I, I talk about this in the region training, but for me, it's this triad. And, and, and if I can really help instill one thing, if this isn't already a part of your judging mantra, is impression analysis and comparison. Can I have everybody, if you haven't already, the easiest way is take a screenshot of this mm -hmm. right now and have this as a reference. This will be available, but that will be readily available for you if you can come back and refer to it. I think this is going to be huge on your day of, of uh, when you have your, your contest or your judging. Yeah, and I, and I did a macro and a micro version because I think for me as a judge, I do a little bit of both. The macro is for the first you know minute or so of the performance, I'm getting an impression of the group. And you even see it goes before the zero mark. I'm not saying we're judging before, but you know, I'm beginning to get an impression as the group comes out. If I'm judging music, how many tubas do they have? I mean, like you just kind of some of those things begin to enter in, and then you spend the middle part of the performance in analysis mode. And as you feel it wrapping up, you begin to do some comparison. But also on the micro level, you're repeating that process hundreds of times during the performance, where you're getting an impression of something, quick analysis, and then in your mind comparing it to the standard, so that you can evaluate and give the strongest and, and most well thought out number uh, when it comes to impression analysis and comparison. So essentially, it kind of looks like this, right? We have the ratings, we understand the established norms, we understand the sheets and the philosophy, and that's passed down from the region level. And we'll see that, that framework today from the region level to the area level to the state level. And then we engage in this process of impression analysis and comparison. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about before our quiz are the five boxes. I think it's really essential to understand that this very much like the previous sheets is divided into five boxes. They look a little different, but they're still in five boxes. The performance and the conditions may vary over the course of the day, but we need to use these in a uniform manner. This delineated scale, and it's divided into thirds, you can see inside of each one, so it's essentially like 15 little boxes, should help with uniformity of placement. So that proper application requires a significant understanding of where the standards are and that the words we're using help match. You see words like always, consistently, usually, and that we notice how often we use those and how it can help us determine where a group goes within these categories, the lower, the middle third, or the upper third. Right? Keep in mind that these tools are incredibly helpful, but nothing is of greater importance in the day of area, in the day of state, mm -hmm. than ranking the groups are rating the groups and ranking the groups, giving them that score and placing them in the right order inside of the caption you're allowed to judge. Anything on I, that? I know several judges, you, we, sometimes we have apprehensions about this, don't mm -hmm. we? Like we feel like, man, I can catch things all day. How do I quantify it? How do mm -hmm. I make it where it becomes an, an objective uh, idea? And we're going to show you some ways to merge those together. So you are having to be thinking while you're giving those comments, like, well, I'm using the word consistently a lot. That's <laughs> kind of telling you your answers. So it's, right. already, it's already giving you a chance to focus. Or I need to recognize this. Is this really incomplete? comparison to some of the other ones. This one, uh, there are some strategies will involve with that one, but as you're getting these five boxes, and do notice that the points are distributed on all the sheets. They're not always all this one on the bottom, that's an example, but uh, intentionally of where the points are distributed based off of the, uh, the history of the contest and the levels that we're going to be seeing ahead of time. So don't stress about it, but realize you do need to have a plan going forward, and a good old tick on the middle of that box sometimes is as good as anything to say, that's where I want to live, and it'll tell your answer of the, of the yeah, yeah, those ticks are, are really helpful to just kind of go, this is where they are in this factor, and this mm -hmm. is where they are in this descriptor. Um, so, as I said, each caption is subject to ranking and rating, and, and we do want to avoid ties. Um, it's okay inside of some of the subcaptions if you have a tie between something, but when you get to that bottom line number, as you well know, we can't have any ties. Uh, and, and ideally, if we manage our numbers well, we can avoid ties throughout the day. Um, so I think, was there anything else? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to go over that no, before we get to our first quiz. We're great, let's take a quiz. Okay, so if you're scanning your device, you are more than welcome to scan it from there. If you are on in the chat, 
I'm gonna go ahead and paste it right there and you can click out and take it from there. So you can either uh, take that quiz inside of the chat or you can scan that and, uh, and go ahead from there. Let me get Mark and I's picture out of there. Man, that's gonna be your problem is we're in your, see that, yeah. we're, we're in your way. Hmm. No, not that one, but that one. There you go. Get Mark and I out of there for a second. So go ahead and take a moment on your own if you want to to take that quiz and I'll be quiet for a second. How about that? Hey guys, I'm sorry a few of you have said that for some reason it's showing on mine that it's sending through, but some of you aren't able to see it, and I'm not sure why it's doing that to you. Let's see. Yeah, and you can always use your, your camera in that. Of course, I took it away from you, didn't I? Let me see. I'll try that one more time, Mark. I don't know if that one came through. Yeah, the Mark Easton had a good idea. Just use a standard QR code on your phone and maybe take it in its Google Doc. Let's see, I'll try it there. I change my settings to a live chat to see if that works. Nothing on my end? Nothing here. Okay. Let's see. I don't know if I have another good way to share that with you guys. Several are having success on their phones. So. Yeah, I'll put that link back up so you can see it. Um, and so apologize that, that that's that working. I'm not sure why the QR code, it shows that it sends and doesn't refuse on my end, but uh, the QR may be the way for the day. I'll, uh, when we show our first video, I'll do a quick troubleshoot. So don't worry, you won't get far behind. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll, uh, but I'll be able to, to share that one with you. It's kind of strange. Maybe there's right. a reason why I can't share a, a, a a link. A link. Look one more time here. Oh, lots of you have responded. That's good. See. I'll try a short UIL or a short URL. Excuse me. Let's see if this one works. Did that one come through on yours by chance? No. Nope. It doesn't like me posting a uh, a Google form. I think is the issue. an embed code all right well not to worry I promise I will share it with you and I'll work on it on the break when we show this first video here in a minute um, and I'll get that going for you so let me transition <coughs> back to our our show here all right again sorry for that on the quiz. I'm not sure why it doesn't want to share to the chat with you. I think I've shared it 17 or 18 times. Uh, and it shows it on my end, but it's not showing it on Mark's end. So it's clearly not going through for whatever reason. But uh, I'll, I'll do some research 
and I'll figure that one out for you. But thank you for your patience on that. We're going to dive into talking about specifics now uh, of area music. So I always like that. I do want to remind you that it's not just area music, but it's also 1A through 4A state music. Um, and so for our folks who are in judging the 1A through 4A, or if you're a band director in the 1A through 4A classes, this is also going to apply to you uh, on this front. And so uh, we've got some videos to share with you. But before we do that, the sheets are online. Uh, if you haven't seen them, they're on the UIL website. Very easy to find, and they're very well labeled between front and back. Don't worry, we're going to zoom in and show you some stuff uh, as we make our way through. I did first want to say that, and this we're not going to go deep into this graphic, but one of the things that, that Mark did a great job with in steering the committee was to ensure that everything on the region box ended up in the area box. If you remember, there used to be things on region that didn't make their way into area, and you were kind of like, wait, where did this... Everything from region now makes its way into area uh, here. And so there are no new descriptors that come up inside of this part. Now I'll show you some new things that come up in a second. Some of you I know like those older sheets and you're comfortable because you've judged on them for many years. There's the old area music box and you can see, and I'm not gonna trace all the lines across because it would look like spaghetti, but everything over there also flows across uh, into we, those. We condensed, we consolidated, we did kind of say, well, there's a couple things, we'll just read word the wording, but it's all in there, just in a more concise manner. Now, I do have to say, we took intonation out of the percussion box, because <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. that was just for the timpanist, maybe. Yeah, I, exactly. uh, and we drums. changed it to precision and timing, which we right. feel like for percussion was probably a better descriptor right. anyway. Um, and again, seeing the difference between the old uh, and the new area sheets. I didn't want to spend too much time here. If you want screenshots of these, you can shoot me an email and I'm happy to share them. If you're like, Jerry, I am so into that old sheet and I just, this new thing is frustrating to me and I want to see that comparison. Like, you just reach out and I will share them. Um, the one thing I'll say with each of the sheets from, and you'll notice this trend today, from region to area, from area to state, some new things mm -hmm. find their way into the sheets. And the one new in the area music one is this bullet. It's called content with respect to challenge. You're going to notice that as you progress through, the word content begins to matter more and more. As you're kind of beginning to determine the best of the best, the best of the best, right. and you keep adding on what's being asked of those performers, how challenging their show is, um, the, the level of demand that's placed upon them. As that rises, then you're going to see that begin to enter into the scoring conversation. Sure, I, I love that because it's those top groups at the area finals, when you are asked to judge at the state level, uh, those were some areas and those were topics I wish that were on the previous sheets mm. because sometimes I had to kind of manipulate and work. And okay, I'm going to really try to decipher there, but now there's a whole dedicated descriptor toward that where groups of excellence, this group after group that are just showing how, how well they can play or how well they can move, now I can discuss there's, there's, there's some ensembles that maybe have just a little stronger vocabulary or a little bit wider range of things that they're using to do, and then the excellence level, of course, uh, falling, falling suit. Yeah, yeah. So here's a zoom in of the sheet, and I know you don't need it read to you, but the sheet's divided into five boxes uh, on the area and 1A through 4A state. Uh, music sheet. It starts with an ensemble box that contains things like phrasing, style and articulation, dynamic contrast. You see the front of the sheet and then the back has a question that goes with each one. The answer to that question, and let's you and I just play the game with the first one. The first one says, to what degree do the performers demonstrate phrasing and artistic expression that is the highest musical value? Mm -hmm. If your answer is they consistently do that, mm -hmm. How consistently? Very consistently? Somewhat consistently? Consistently bordering on usually? They always? Almost always? You know, again, that these boxes, as you look, the answer to that question, you heard Mark say earlier, you could just put a little tick mark, because you could. You could literally just go in and put a little tick mark at consistently and where that is, and then answer the next question, blend and balance. Oh, well, that's a little bit over here, right? One thing I love about, let's say we, it was a, a consistently and it was in the sort of consistent, well between the range, look at the bottom of the back of the sheet, 176 to 193, I think it says, or 192, somewhere in that range, I'm already kind of thinking, here's an area for that one topic, and then I'm starting to notice a trend or a theme mm -hmm. happening. This group really is living in this area, not that they can't move back and forth, but it's starting to kind of move around, move around, and then it starts kind of honing in and like, this is their neighborhood. This, yep. is, this is the group that's telling me who they are. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. The woodwind and brass boxes look identical. They have tone quality, intonation, technique, and accuracy, blend, and balance. The, you see, I mean, you can see I can flip, I'm flipping back and forth, right? They look exactly identical, copy and paste. The percussion one, as I mentioned, a little different because we're not talking about intonation, but we talk about quality, precision, technique, and accuracy. But other than that, they are very similar. And then a content box at the bottom. 
right? And inside of that content box, we're talking about the coordination and effective use. We're talking about effective musical reinforcement. We're going to let our video guys talk about this in a second, right. but it can kind of show you a little bit about how those five divisions um, are boxed into there. I'll pause here for a second. And so I want to share our first video with you. So um, one of the things you heard Dr. Kent say is that uh, this is a, a training brought to you for Texas band directors by Texas band directors. And this first committee was actually one of the last ones we filmed. Right. It was shot here in Coppell, and it included Mark leading a panel discussion with Andy Seely from Hebron, with Rich Armstrong, uh, and with Randy Jones. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really great discussion. And so they're going to talk a little bit about it. And we've got a couple of clips from them to let you hear a little bit about how they view uh, this process. So take a listen. For those of you who are worried about the quiz during this video show, and I'm going to go back into the tech side and see if I can get that first quiz to post. So, so don't stress, kind of refocus in here. We'll get you back in, and then uh, I'll figure out how to get that quiz link out to you. And if I have to just send you guys an email with all of them, I'll, I'll do that too. All right. Here is our first uh, area music clip. Absolutely. I, I believe that as I'm listening to a group and I look at that, that particular first area of ensemble performance, I think of the word together. When you look at, are they together when they start and stop their notes? Are they together when they, when they play their phrases? Are they together when they get loud? Are they together when they get soft? And so I, I just, are they together in their approach to the musical phrases and lines? Mm -hmm. Andy, what do you think about when you when you uh, see that first ensemble performance box? Well, I think there's, first of all, I think there's a lot of really awesome things in this ensemble box out mm -hmm. there. And the thing that I want to be aware of as a judge or feel is intent and purpose. Mm -hmm. That there's been decision making going on there and that the performers are following the plan. Um, we want to hear that with regard to dynamics. We want to hear that with regard to, to phrasing. We want to hear that in terms of the uniformity of the style of articulation that they're playing or the way the articulation is being delivered. Mm -hmm. So that choices have been made and the performers are executing that choice. Mm -hmm. So some really purposeful and thoughtful intent of Real the music. In intentional there. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, absolutely. Very good. Randy, what do you think about that first box? Uh, well, I want to agree with both of these gentlemen. Um, as a judge, when you get into the area level, um, one, you've got to, you're trying to, at that point, trying to determine and put a group in order. Mm -hmm. And so as, as I am doing that and listening to that, um, I am, am trying to the point of where does the group go? Are they doing the phrasing? Are they doing the dynamics? Okay, does this, this one group present? more a picture in the dynamics was there more expression in that um, as far as so to allow me to be able to more accurately put the each group where they need, need to be in that so as these two gentlemen have already commented all of those things the the blend the balance the precision are we not having precision problems front to back or side to side um, is there some musical expressions that you're using dynamics to help us bring forth the picture that 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 is there? So, mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm trying to determine looking into that, what, how do I get the the points in in that when I'm doing sure. that? So, I, you hit a really good point. I think on the new sheets that everyone's going to be able to see, there are descriptor boxes now. They're placed not only on the sheet, but it's it's among every category. Uh, when you're talking about where where a group belongs, there's boxes that include always consistently, usually, sometimes, and rarely. And of course, at the area level, we already have, or even at the state level, we have some above average ensembles. So we'll be using a lot of those, those top boxes, but our minds definitely should be kind of going there, what everybody was kind of alluding to, to what degree are we doing those things? Are we together, of course, being intentional, and of course, being uh, being, able, being able to say uh, this group all of a sudden can be great in timing, great in performance, great in execution. So I, I think it's, it's gonna be great, and the uh, judges, I think, are gonna love it when they get to see this. Cool. So I, I hope hearing a little bit of these discussions kind of helps you think not just, and, and I'll say on our on all of our videos today that we're sharing, our, our aim was to get individuals um, not only who have judged at the highest levels, but who have groups performing at those levels um, to talk a little bit about excellence and a little bit about how those boxes divide. Um, I've got a couple more videos to share from that committee because I thought it was one of, it was just a really great discussion. I mean, in this whole process, we had so many great discussions with judges. Do you want to add, uh, uh, did you want to add anything on that one before we watch the next well, one? Well, that's the first thing I thought about seeing Rich, Andy, and, and Randy, the strong teachers proven in the business in all different uh, scenarios and setups, but also if you ever had the opportunity to be evaluated by one of those gentlemen, mm -hmm. uh, 
giving you the exact same comments, thinking as a teacher, giving you great comments that you can give to the students. So uh, especially in area music, we know that's something that's the hallmark of what we're looking for in Texas. And uh, that's a great starting point for you to really invest some time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this next one, they're going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the specifics of the, the woodwind, the brass, and the percussion uh, panels inside of this one. So let's, let's dive into this one. For those of my friends who are asking about the quiz, uh, I was able to share it as TMAA, which I think was part of the issue. So it should now be shared, and you should be able to take it if you want to take it while you watch this next video and you can listen to it uh, as you do it. That's fine. If you want to come back later or on our break in a little while, you could do that as well. Uh, but here's, here's another clip. So as a, as a judge, what one of the things that I am listening for is you have your percussion, you have your brass, and you have your woodwinds. Are they all equally represented in the musical presentation that's mm -hmm. being given? Um, and I, I think that it's important. I know in the, from the 1A to for the 4 area, sometimes there may be a, a woodwind group or a brass group that is not as strong as the other group. Um, and, I, and a director will at times do the very best they can with mm -hmm. what they've been given. but. For me, as, as a judge, as I'm trying to determine that, I am looking to see that they're all equally represented. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's been times that, that I've watched groups that, man, great percussion, great brass, and then the, the woodwinds aren't as strong or represented as well. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm going to rank that, um, I'm going to be looking for the, the group that is equally represented across across the show production mm -hmm. on there, um, and that they're covering all of those. They, that they're, they are, there is good tone quality. There is good intonation consistently, okay, or as we can, as you talked about, always there. Mm -hmm. uh, the technique, how is the, how is the technique of the group, is it appropriate for that, that classification? And then, of course, the, accur the accuracy there. Um, but that's what I am listening for, and as a judge in those particular area and state, I am going to very work very hard to try to give those groups that show that equally across everything mm -hmm. the higher higher points. And in fact, as I judge, I have little box, those little boxes there and I'll, you know, um, the brass may get this point and the, the woodwinds aren't as good and they'll get down and I'll, I'll do every band will be done separately and then whatever the, out, the number comes out is that's what my number is in the end. So. I, I think your group is a great example of that. I, I judged at State this year, and I judged the North Lamar, Lamar group, and they, uh, you're a great example of being able to showcase that. I remember several throw-down woodwind moments in your show or off the bat where they're playing lots of technique, and then it was followed up with the brass moment and how it was real well put together. So, again, it was designed in a way, and I think as, as directors, that could be a new arena for some of us uh, that are going. But then, of course, as adjudicators, we're looking for everyone to get showcased, but also getting a chance to, be, to what degree of excellence are each of those groups being represented along the way. Andy, what do you think about some of those, the woodwind, brass, and percussion boxes there? Uh, well, first of all, I really like, again, the descriptors. And of course, mm -hmm. they're identical on the woodwinds and the, and the brass side. Uh, for, for me, the thing that I'm looking for and listening for is, do the instruments sound like the instruments? Um, are we asking of our performers what is pedagogically appropriate mm -hmm. and music educationally appropriate. I'm not sure that's good English, so you may have to cut that. <laughs> but whatever is appropriate for, um, for student performers. So sure. we want the instruments to sound like the instruments. We have to um, make sure that we're, um, again, for me, I'm listening for basic woodwind choir concepts, basic brass choir concepts? Mm -hmm. Are we making an attempt um, in the performance to show all of the colors possible in that ensemble with what the mechanism, the instrument that we have to work with? And by instrument, I mean the show mm -hmm. that we have to work with there. Are we seeing those colors? I think we have to try to um, have our groups and the groups that we're evaluating toe the line with regard to tone quality and intonation. Mm -hmm. um, we have to have um, a sense about all of that. We have to have a sense in the design effort and all of that about what are we trying to feature. And we can't, um, or we should look for, in my opinion, the variety of colors present, the, the variety of presentations mm -hmm. of the brass ensemble or yep. the woodwind ensemble and what their respective components are. Mm -hmm. You know, we're making choices all the time about 
whether we're going to feature this group or not, well, is it a group we should be featuring? Are we really presenting the supporting elements in mm -hmm. such a way that the feature comes across that way? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of picking and choosing that have to go on in the decision side of that for us to award credit in the performance side of that. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to expect the instruments to sound like the instruments without distortion, that we're making all those dynamic changes without distortion that we ask the kids mm -hmm. to do, and that the fundamental tone of the ensemble is is what we want the ensemble to sound like. Mm -hmm. Now, that may be a subjective thing. We may all have different definitions slightly tolerance of what levels. that is. <laughs> and tolerance levels, too, is a good way to put it. Uh, and, and lastly, in that regard, the percussion section, are we having expectations of the percussion section about color, about dynamics, mm -hmm. about uh, role responsibility? Um, that can, you know, percussion section can dominate the entire ensemble mm -hmm. at any given moment sometimes if we let them. Sure. But what role are we expecting them to play mm -hmm. in the, the uh, ensemble as a whole? Mm -hmm. And so I think exploring the colors of the drum section and then expect, expecting them to not only be clean, so to speak, and right. what we're expecting, but what is their role as a percussion section in that? And then we should have the same expectations of our wins on the field mm -hmm. as we do inside the band hall. It should Agreed. not be a different mm -hmm. expectation and we should um, have really demanding standards for that. Mm -hmm. Great. Rich, any thoughts? I agree with all that. Mm -hmm. But as I'm sitting here thinking, I'm thinking I can't remember the year you had a show and I judged it at state and you had an oboe player that was the ballad, but it was the pre-show was a piece of music that <clears throat> tagged at that. And you opened the show with a woodwind moment. And just immediately you went, wow, what, and you color, what beautiful sounds. Mm -hmm. And then the brass came in. And when the brass came in, you didn't lose the woodwinds. And for me, I think that's very important that we, as you mentioned, and when you, when you play a piece of concert literature inside, it's not, okay, just woodwinds and then just brass right. and then just oboe. It's everybody. And you want to hear everybody. And I think that's one of the challenges at judging is because you do want to give woodwinds credit and you want to give brass credit, but it doesn't always have to be a feature where mm -hmm. they're down parked. And, and we've learned mm -hmm. and that you don't have to do that. And sometimes getting the ensemble to sound good, mm -hmm. it's just a balance. It's like changing the way you balance so that you do hear the woodwinds even though the brass are playing. Mm -hmm. and, and back to the quality sounds and, and the quality uh, intonation, those are all a given. You you want to have that. But it comes back to why can't the whole band play? And I think your band does this really well. The whole band plays and you hear that color from top to colors, bottom. Yeah. It's not just trombone heavy. It's you hear mm -hmm. the brass, you hear the woodwinds, and it's, it's just beautiful. And then when you have that, it's just a big sound. And I mm -hmm. think from a judge standpoint, I'm looking for that. I'm also looking, do you feature? Do you, can they play? Do they have technique? Are they showing off? But at the same time, is it all quality? Mm -hmm. and, um, and it comes back to, what, where's, is it clear what I'm supposed to be listening to? Right. And is there clarity to it? I, I think one thing for our uh, strong evaluators, uh, we, we create those moments. We're creating those opportunities there. But really, you can hear each of these, these judges talking about, hey, it's going to be down to the quality part of it, or we featured them in a way that we really think that's the best way to support them. We're like, well, we're asking those brass players to play way out of bounds right now. And as an adjudicator, we have to say we're giving as much credit as we can. And we, again, circle back to was it usually having good tone quality or was it always having good tone quality or the technique being clear, et cetera. And I'd love to hear all three of you kind of reiterate that. That's an important theme, not only for our teachers, but especially for people that are evaluating the experts. When you're asked to judge, it's okay to make that call. Just because they have that moment doesn't mean you have to say you maxed out woodwind uh, technique and credit. It's to what degree did they able to be successful, whether it be effective or uh, excellence at that same level. Yeah, I, I mean, again, Mark and I were just talking about how do you sum up a clip like that, and it's like there's so much great information um, being shared by those folks, and I, and I think the thing I come back to is that every group is contributing, that we're listening for that woodwind, and, and when you think about the state sheet going forward into separate woodwind and brass percussion sheets, as area adjudicators, we help them on that road by making sure that we're talking evenly and consistently to those groups. Right, the snapshot becomes more and more apparent about groups that are helping lead the groups that are maybe a 
not a, not, not a deficit, but also with their contribution, I guess. I'm really excited about this next clip. You're talking about content. Uh, we, as we get a chance to delve into it, I think that's at the area level, we get a chance to really delve into this, where you do recognize uh, substance in the design and the, the the watt part of it, and then of course how the th the uh, performers bring it to life. Right, and and remember, 850 points of this area sheet is still focused on the the, the stuff we were just talking about ensemble, yes. about woodwind, brass, percussion. But 150 points have been set aside for us to talk a little bit about content. So let's hear the same panel. This is a shorter discussion, just about three four minutes. Talk a little bit about what are they looking for in terms of content. Challenge. So I want to be. I want to feel as an adjudicator like I'm seeing what I'm hearing, and vice versa. There's a reciprocal sure. relationship there, certainly. And I want to feel that the material has musical challenge to it. That's not limited, limited to hear or hear. That's mm -hmm. listening challenge, uh, environmental, environmental challenge, challenge, simultaneous mm -hmm. demand of choreography. Man, mm -hmm. there's so much stuff that goes into that. Sure. Um, and then we want to uh, listen and evaluate how the ebb and flow of the musical program is with regard to uh, tension and release mm -hmm. of the whole thing. I mean, it's an overall arch that we're really going through. So there's a lot of components, and I apologize for talking a long time on that, That's but right. there is a lot of stuff right. in that that we have to make decisions on as band directors and um, as um, the design process goes on. But mm -hmm. once it's out there, we have to make sure the judge can hear and see right. what we want them to hear and see. Sometimes it's a balance thing, as Rich pointed out, mm -hmm. accurately. Sometimes it's a supporting elements versus the melody. So the, all those decisions that are regarding content and challenge also, I think, are balance and blend things in the ensemble category mm -hmm. because are we creating the environment to see and hear what we need to with regard to priority of line? Accompaniment versus melody versus counterline right. versus, you know, whatever that is, rhythmic accompaniment. So uh -huh. we're back to that percussion element. Great. So A many, lot of words. Sorry about no, that. That's okay. So many great points. To uh, Either of you have anything to add to that? I, I, I don't have anything to add because what, what Andy said was fantastic. I would just, as a director, as you start this process, just remember there are times um, I need you need to take what he said and then in your rehearsals, okay, if you're trying to do some technique, technique spot and you're trying to figure out what kind of visual are you going to march here, don't be afraid to make it easier. If you can come mm -hmm. up with some visual and all of a sudden you're realizing that it's, it's not working, right. it's going to take too long to get it to the level it needs to be, it's not worth right. the effort, then be willing, be willing to modify it to where the kids will be successful and the, then you're going to be successful as a, as a program. Yeah, even more effective probably in a lot of ways. And even more effective that. and never, in my opinion, never cut the expectation on your music, mm -hmm. the musical part of it. Great. So. As I'm, I'm listening to Andy, I'm thinking, oh my gosh. As a director, you mentioned that, as a director, before you even hand something to the kids, mm -hmm. these descriptors need to be discussed as a staff. They need to be discussed as a team to understand what it is you're trying to, to accomplish. And so you have the end in mind. And something I'm thinking about is less is more. Less is more. Sometimes we try to, try to, to get more content out there, and we think that more done in the usual the usual middle of the box right. is better, when in reality, less done in the always box would be way more effective. And, and so as a judge, making sure you know, you're notating those things that are at that usual, at that very top always box, mm -hmm. and, and what's done, what, are they trying to do too much? And notating that. And I think as a, when you design the content, that's important. Less so, is more. And, and you mentioned, if you're not getting something right, in the middle of the process, I mean, if it's just not happening, less is more. And I think, right. I think a good adjudicator will, will pick up on that, and the quality and the excellence level will go up. I, I often think we should probably release the, the unedited conversations of these because there is so much great right. knowledge, not just as a judge, but I mean, I like that Rich there is, is talking to band directors <laughs> like, uh, hey, are you as a staff talking about, and I know we have a lot of band directors joining us today, are you as a staff talking about these descriptors? Is this part of your lesson planning, part of your content 
uh, and design when, when we talk about what are we doing content wise because right now certainly everybody's all in the thick of content yes. you know very few are getting to the performance excellent stuff that we'd like to right now we're, we're all just kind of yeah we're getting it on the field and I understand mm -hmm. that and so for the directors who are joining us as well as you know the judges who are you know kind of thinking about this process that content piece it's a small part as I said 150 out of the thousand points but it begins as you move to state for 5A6 it begins to move into that kind of half and half and that shared responsibility between the two yeah I, I, it, for lifelong learners, which all of us are, it, it's, it was great to even get a chance to talk with these people, the before conversations, the after conversations, and uh, yeah, we'll have the, the unedited versions that kind of show you even more if you're interested in this. Yeah. So this next panel, we're going to go down to Leander, Texas. Uh, we had a chance to visit with Mike Howard from Vandegrift, Robert Saladin at Leander, Eric Cosman, who does a lot of the electronics work for the Boston Crusaders, and Mike Zellers, who's at Leander, but also who does work for the Boston Crusaders, to talk about electronics. Um, on the area music front, maybe more so than anywhere else, this seems to be a big stressor. And so we let these guys just kind of talk about from a design perspective, what are you looking for? How do you put all of those things together? Um, so you want to just jump to, into that clip? Yeah, I'm sure some of you have some uh, apprehensions in this area, and I think you're going to love their insights. Not that you'll have it all uh, kind of figured out, but it can again, give you some food for thought. I would definitely want to take notes about some of the key points that these guys are going to be talking about. Yeah, this is a little longer clip. It's about 10 minutes, but mm -hmm. we hope you enjoy what they have to share. I think it's lots of great, uh, great information. So here's a little more on area music and how it can relate to electronics. What these sheets now do, in a great way, I think a positive way, is it opens up... Um, this kind of clarity to each part of the ensemble as opposed to just a general judge sitting up there and going, what do I hear from everything that's there without guidance? I like that this gives you more guidance. I like that it gives you direct things not only as a judge but also as an educator to help dictate how you're rehearsing and what you're listening for. Um, so when I like look at the sheet and I'm thinking about the items that are on here, for me it's more about how those items relate and have relation to each other. Um, thinking about is the percussion ensemble, uh, there's obvious moments of, it, you hear it all the time, of overbalanced percussion ensemble or electronics on a sheet, but how are those things happening organically with each other? And are you purposely creating moments within the program um, to allow for each of those elements to be heard? Um, are you purposely guiding your teaching? Are you purposely guiding the performance and what's being written to allow for moments of total transparency and clarity? Is each of those elements clearly being taught that the uh, articulation and the style and the length of the note is exactly the same from ensemble to ensemble, from the bass drum player all the way to the flute player in a feature, that there's clarity from one side of the program all the way to the other? What do you guys got? Yeah, so the, in specific to the area, the area sheet, you know, I think it's as an adjudicator, it's a challenge because you, you know, you want to you want to keep integrity of each of these sub captions, and you also want to look at the whole picture. I think as you go through the program, it's important you take opportunities to not get too hung up in uh, sampling one thing that you miss another. Um, you want to take opportunities to really dig into the woodwind sound, really dig into the brass sound, really dig into the percussion sound, and of course the effective use of electronics should, should they be choosing to use electronic reinforcement. Um, I think it's, it's important that you as, you, as you wrap up listening to the ensemble, that you give yourself enough time to accurately look at each at each box when you're looking at that area sheet, which for any of us that have judged area, we know that's a that's a challenge. You've got a short amount of time and, and you want to really give each sub caption its specific due and integrity. Um, but from a judging perspective, I think making sure you've got your due diligence and that you're constantly sampling around the ensemble, never allowing yourself to get hung up in one spot uh, makes you a lot more successful at the end as you go from caption to caption to caption to caption. I do think, you know, it, the new sheet gives us an opportunity to, uh, as a director, uh, looking specifically at the area sheet, to make sure that all the colors in the ensemble are present. Um, and it gives the judge an opportunity to really sample all of the colors in the ensemble. So are we hearing, you know, are we, when we hear the, uh, electronic sounds and the amplification of the group and I know if I think back to how we were amplifying our, our woodwind ensemble in 2016 at Vandegrift it was 
it was not representative of how those instruments were supposed to sound, you know, but I fast forward to some better choices that we made in 2017 or 2019. Um, and I think we did a better job making a flute sound like a flute and making a clarinet sound like a clarinet. Um, but I think that this is another thing that this, this sheet can give credit for is making sure that we're making smart reinforcement decisions with the with electronics that also bleeds into you know effective use of woodwind playing or if I'm amplifying percussion effective use of of percussion performance um, so yeah on the director side I just think it's a great opportunity to help ensure that all of the colors are shining through um, in in one single sheet yeah, I, I really like what you're talking about reinforcement. You know, to me, effective use of electronics, there's there's kind of three almost subcaptions, if you will. There's reinforcement, which is just taking acoustic instruments and making them able to be heard at the top of a giant football stadium, right? And then there's your soundscape, which is all of your synthesizers, your sound effects, all of those synthetic sounds. And then you've got kind of your, your processing, which is like you take an acoustic instrument and you run it through electronic to create a totally different sound. And I think when you're looking at really what is an effective use, looking at those three different things, you know, not just is it blended well, you know, but balance is obviously something that we focus on a lot, but in, in addition to that, you know, is the, is the, is the timbre correct? You know, does it sound like a flute? You know, the, the, the big thing when I'm reinforcing a sound is what I'll do is I'll have it, I'll get it all EQ'd up, reverb, whatever, and then you just turn it on and turn it off. And when it just sounds louder and softer, that's when you know you've got it. You know, all of these EQs and reverbs and all of these things, those are tools that, you know, our ears hear an instrument versus a microphone, it's gonna color the sound a little different. So those are tools, and the speakers color sound as well, so those are tools to fix the inaccuracies of those artificial elements uh, replicating the sound. So, you know, when you're talking strictly reinforcement, you know, I think reverb is a big thing where sometimes we just, we overdo it. You know, the purpose of reverb is so it sounds like what you're seeing, you know? So if you've got a flute player who's two inches from a microphone, it's gonna sound like that. So you had a little bit of reverb, so it sounds like they're more in a room, but when it sounds like, well, you know, they're huge in the Grand Canyon, that's not really what a flute sounds like. So I, I, I love the, the reinforcement. Unless it was in the Grand Canyon. Unless, unless that's what you're going for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, then that's where I think that's where intent like comes into all of this is like I think when I look at this sheet, um, you know, look at these sheets and you have the different things. It's all about intent, what you want to come across. And I think that the, the electronic side of it kind of touches every side of this or can affect every every portion of, of this sheet. Um, when I look at this um, sheet, and I'm thinking as an adjudicator, I think about this as a, a two-show day. You, you know, for area, you have prelims and finals. And when I'm trying to go through this sheet, and I'm like going through the sheet, and as Mike was saying, like trying to hit all of those spots, it's like pretty hard, especially on the electronic side, because you might not be dialed in for that room of the day. So you're playing in a stadium you've never been in, and you're not dialed in. Your stuff isn't right. So as an adjudicator, it can be it can be tricky to read through that and actually still try to find those spots. So I think in that first read, you know, I think you, you, as an adjudicator, you, you bring up these issues, you know. This is a balance issue, you know. There's too much reverb on that solo for, you know, my taste. Um, your EQ on that solo, it doesn't sound like a flute player. Like, in that first read, I think you're getting those things out, and at, at that point, it's the, the job of the, the band director to get in there, listen to those tapes and make adjustments for the night show. And then hopefully at that point, you know, you've you've went through and made a lot of adjustments and really kind of taken that feedback and, and used that, you know. And then on the band director side, if you get that feedback and you decide that's not what you want to do, then that's not what you want to do because you're, you, you know, you're trying to be true to whatever you're trying to present. So for me, it comes down to in the in, intent and trying to get everything to come across clearly. That's it. Sorry, I was sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say, in the same realm, like as a director, I think there's a risk that comes with doing some of these things because you're. I, I think there's a misinterpretation maybe of what electronics could potentially be. I think some people think electronics. Oh, I'm going to have a giant whoosh in this big electronic sound that's going to. Have, I don't. That's not the intention. I think of what we're talking about here. It's like, how how are you using these elements to enhance what's happening on the field to show off your kids in a way that is going to be 
you know, appropriate and mature. And then I think within that, what these guys do great is uh, it's organic. It doesn't affect the quality of what's there. It doesn't affect the intent of what's there. Uh, it's just helping to enhance and create. And so I think there's a balance there as a director going into a two show thing. If you don't have the opportunity to get into a stadium, uh, if you don't have an opportunity to be able to balance that other than on your marching field and on your tower looking down at the kids, that's a risk you, you take. And you need to know what you can and can't do within your program and your environment, not to just do things because it says on the sheet, well, now I have to use electronics, do what's best for your program first and foremost and for your kids. If you decide you're going to use those, then you need to create opportunities for the kids to be in a place that you can assess what's actually happening there. And I think just like a judge having to understand that you need to give comments on a first read, like, hey, this could be, if you get another show, this is something you should fix. There's another element on the directors to be responsible with this, that they have to do things that are not going to impact all of the kids on the field by making decisions that are... Um, not best for the program. I think, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. 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 And I, I think, you know, for me as a director, when I, I go into this, sometimes like the intent of what I'm trying to get across is not what the judge is reading, you know? And sometimes that needs a second show for that to come across. Uh, you know, I, th I think it, in, the, in the past when it's come to electronic imbalance, the presence of electronics has been an overbalance. And I don't know that that's necessarily a direction that we need to be heading, you know, globally. Now, the presence of electronics within some shows, like if you feel it and you hear it there, it's way too much then. But like if you're presenting something that's pretty modern, like you can't have a modern presentation without that voice being there. So at that point, when you hear that, you know, that's kind of an element of that. So I think when, you, when you're putting together your shows, just try to be clear about your intent and then, you know, um, you know, that's for this format, we never get to kind of speak with the adjudicator and say, here's what we're trying to do, you know. But, on the other side of that, if someone's saying this isn't coming across clearly, your idea is probably not coming across clearly. You know, it's it's like the the hill of artistic integrity is a lonely hill to die on. <laughs> you know, just because you think it's that it's, might not be that. You know, I I had to end with Mike's quote of the hill of artistic integrity is I, a I lonely hill to die on. That says that right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I thought the discussion about just kind of how all of that has worked for those teams, uh, for, you know, for those guys in Leander and just kind of the evolution that they've seen from, as Mike Howard talked about, miking instruments and making sure that they sound like the instrument that you want to be represented all the way through to what Mike Zellers was saying at the end about, is it a modern show? Well, are the sounds modern? Is it a classical show? Are you matching those things? So um, that kind of gives you a little bit of perspective into how we think about electronics, how we think about balance inside of the marching band activity. It's definitely... Uh a little intimidating the the scale and scope and the type of stage we're asking to do all this on where it's not a musical theater but it is like a, a bigger football field with outdoor elements and uh, kudos to uh, the, the folks that are figuring those things out but of course we all have to take time because any one set of electronics could cancel out any kind of acoustical excellence that we've created so it is it is a layer and it is something that has to be evaluated so when you do see it as a, an adjudicator it's to what degree is it effective and to what degree is, is the fidelity something that we consider to be on the same uh, par of excellence as the uh, the uh, actual ensemble itself yeah yeah and so we went back in we're going to do one that was a longer clip this is a short clip with this panel just another three four minutes we asked them to talk a little bit about the coordination piece of it just how do you coordinate electronics into a program and so i think as adjudicators for us to understand especially if we're not actively doing this um what are directors going through what are programs going through to to make this all seem like one holistic um kind of centered piece that isn't a combination of parts that feel disjointed. So uh, check out this last uh, little short clip uh, from the Leander team talking about electronics. I think a, a huge statement in the, the, you know, looking at the area sheet, uh, the, the coordination and effective use of all performing elements, performing being the key word. As an adjudicator, it's so important. We understand a prop is not performing and a, a front scrim is not performing and a tarp laying on the field is not performing. Uh, the students are the ones that are being artistic and are the ones that are making the content of the show come across. So I think as, as adjudicators, it's important that we're able to read through um, some of the things that may be out there and we focus on the performing elements. That's one of my favorite things about this, this sheet, that, that that is the first sentence that is under that content box. 
Um, so just for all adjudicators, I really want to draw our attention to that idea of performing elements. And then with that, then you get into your ability as an adjudicator to give credit for demand, for frequency of movement, um, uh, for groups that are, you know, from an ensemble standpoint, that are playing a lot. You know, uh, if I've got if I've got 200 kids on the field, how much are those 200 kids really playing their instrument? You know what I mean? This is where you have a chance. You have a chance to reward frequency of movement, frequency of playing, frequency of demand throughout the show within the guises of making sure that your the your decision making as an adjudicator is on the actual performers that are that are making it all happen. Um, so that's that's the big the big thing I think as adjudicators we, adjudicators we should be careful of. We want to make sure that we are rewarding what the students um, are conveying throughout the duration of the performance, and it also gives us an opportunity that you know from a from a holistic standpoint to continue to grow the activity because as adjudicators it allows us to give directors feedback on you know potential pacing issues, you know, where are those lulls or those places that feel really transitional um, rather than, uh, you know, it, it feeling like it's part of the seamless whole, you know what I mean? And I think we can continue to progress and move forward with these sheets, with the information that we give the directors. And that, you know, that's part of it, not just assigning a number. Uh, we create a system of, of adjudication that continues to progress the activity. Uh, so that would that would be my big couple of thought processes on that part of the sheet. I agree, and I think that it. What's cool about this change to our sheets is that it allows a judge to decipher between is it is the problem performance quality of the student, or is the problem the actual design and content of what the student is being asked to do, and those are two separate things to me. Like, are your students not playing in time because you haven't addressed? their listening responsibilities or are they not playing in time because of the content that's there or where they're standing on the field and we haven't been able to assess that before and that's as much a part of this performance quality as the actual stuff that they're doing performing on the field so yes I mean we're talking about you know judging the performance quality of what the students are doing and I think at the same time like as a director what I like about this is you sit there and you can look down the box and go am I having moments here where the content is actually conducive of what my kids can do? Am I forcing the situation and having this technical moment that my kids are not ready for and it's actually going to be more of a hindrance on the program than it is actually helping the program? Um, am I actually creating frequency and movement, frequency and pacing? And it gets you to think as a director, like sit down before you even start the year and look through your music and look through your drill and make decisions that are going to set your students up for success and actually show these things off on the sheet. And then as a judge, now I get to actually decipher between, you know, it, I want to talk about this moment that's not great, um, but this isn't a kid problem. This is actually a, an issue with the design of what the performance is. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's so key. Like, it gives the adjudicator a way to, um, you know, actually make values on, like, if the moment is appropriate for, for the student. I think if you look at the sheet, there's 850 points that the students directly have on achievement. And there's only 150 points on the actual content of what's being offered. And I think when you break that down on the pure, on the pure math of it, it puts it directly on the students. Yeah, and so to, to finish up with, with Mike's point there, you know, it puts that, that onus directly on the students when it comes to the content. And, and I thought Robert said it well, when we're thinking about what we're asking of them, that we as, as directors are going through our content now and ensuring that it's achievable. Um, that it's not just achievable, but artistically, you know, that, that it has merit. Right. Uh, the, the success of the students is so important. Is it time for our next quiz? It is. Uh, I've posted the next quiz on the screen, and if you're on the chat, it works now. Sorry, I had to figure that out, that I had to post it as TMAA, the host of our, um, of our live stream today. And so you should be able to see that. With that, we're going to take a two-minute stretch break. You can take your quiz, and maybe if you're on your device, walk around the room. And Mark and I will be back with you in just a minute or two to talk area visual.
All right, I'll give you a couple more seconds to finish up that quiz. Number two. I guess I can see results. I wanted to congratulate you. You did really well on quiz number one. <laughs> Our class average is a 99.08. Look so at that. that. The is, curve has been set. That is awesome. Uh, quiz number two looks like you're still rolling in. Our average is a 97.6, so doing well, I hope. And, and again, if you're not happy with your score, if you want to, re you're more than welcome to just restart it again. Uh, I want to make sure that you get it right and that you feel comfortable with all your answers. We could be posting certain scores up online. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> that just seems mean. All right. Well, good. It looks like everything's flowing along. We're gonna we're gonna dive into talking a little bit about uh, about area visual. If you're finishing up the quiz, it's okay. Just hang with us. We're gonna keep the pace moving today. We want to stay on schedule and get you out on time. Um, and so let's go ahead and, and dive into a discussion of area visual. The sheet looks very similar to the area music sheet. The area music sheet was divided into five boxes. The area visual sheet's divided into three boxes. We're going to zoom in on those uh, here in just a moment. But just like I did with the previous uh, sheet, I want to flow you through. Uh, and, and, and the work that, that Mark shared on this committee with the region visual box, you can see that from region visual, everything pulls across. We do have some new things. Those are the ones that are circled, and we'll talk about those here uh, in just a moment. Uh, there's the region visual content box, and you can see how all of that comes across, and a, a, new, a new word enters the visual sheet that was not on the previous. Um, as well, if you like the old sheet and how it transitions, I know that looks like spaghetti, guys, but just to show you, like, everything uh, connects across from the old to the new, uh, from the old to the new. I, I do want to say, because I think uh, we're going to hear a discussion about it later, ranks, files, diags, you know, that, that, that stayed on there. It, it, it goes forward into the achievement uh, of form and interval uh, as, as well, you know, so that you can see that pulling through. And, you know, some of these with a couple of new things like coordination and staging um, entering into the conversation over on the content side. Um, so let's, uh, let's just zoom into each of the boxes here for a sure. second, uh, and then we'll get to do some discussion on these. Uh, we have some great panelists that joined us on them as well. Um, so we'll first talk uh, just a little bit about the, the individual and the ensemble, but we have control of form and interval. We have control of body, control of equipment. Those are like the three kind of mm -hmm. controls, as it were. Then we have precision and timing, demonstration of individual style, poise, presence, and communication, which is not on the region sheet, makes its way to the area sheet as a new item to kind of really bring those groups up, and recovery. It wouldn't be a visual sheet if it didn't have recovery. What, what are your thoughts on those? Sure. Individually, I, we, we all know the evolution that we've seen the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years of the responsibilities what the performers do. No longer is it just the color guard give us the visual package mm. while the, uh, the, the brass players, the woodwind players, and the, and the percussionists create the musical package. The performers are all uh, sometimes um, seamless and they're also coordinated together and some have different responsibilities. With that becomes training that the uh, directors are asked to do, uh, but it be in our job as evaluators to what degree are they being successful? or do, do they look like they're trained? Are we able to give them a skill set? Sometimes it's uh, yes, the color guard members can do this advanced skill, but have we laid the groundwork to let those individuals be successful in this next area? And uh, there, this, this has a whole new uh, set of branches to it. Um, the, the layman's term I love on this one is, does the movie match the soundtrack? Mm. Do, do we want to make sure the movie that we're watching match this incredible sound score that goes along the way? And we start seeing some ensemble comments with coordination a little bit, but especially individually, uh, are, are, we, are we setting the students to be successful? Yeah. And so when we look a little bit at the ensemble side, fairly similar achievement of form and interval, precision and timing, uniformity, professionalism, and there's our recovery. And, and I do want to point out those, those, uh, those placemat questions are right there again for you to answer. So we'll, we'll play this game. We played this game with the last one. To what degree do the performers demonstrate uh, depth of training in a clear, uniform approach to style? Well, you could say they usually or consistently or always. I mean, I remember those, um, those, the original rubrics that we'd been using for several years, which I, I know it's got Colson and some guys, came, those were great. I mean, they were just the hallmark of what we did. We, we aim to take that same approach that that panel put those together with and go, how can we make it faster? You know, it wasn't necessarily about making it different or reframing, just how can we make it faster? Well, I can ask, I can answer these one, two, three, four, five, six questions, five questions, 
tick these boxes, kind of like Mark was talking about earlier, put your tick marks where you think that group is and then find where those five tick marks went and look at the center and go, well, that's that's mm -hmm. where they are numerically. I, I think we all would agree the layout is so much more open mm -hmm. and I think it's more inviting and I don't think it's as simple as turning the page sideways. I think it was this, give it <laughs> on the back of the page where we summarize it since he was asking the same questions over and over. It gives you a chance because you, you really are trying to dedicate your time to the performance on the field. We don't want you just to be listening and have your head buried down into a sheet. We want it to be where you could glance at something or keep your finger on one spot that you know that you could go back to later if you need to. Yeah. And so with that, I, I want to share a clip. We're going to jump over to the Woodlands, Texas, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the maybe one. Mark and I were just talking about this on the break while you guys were watching that video um, about props and how props and performer responsibilities and all that can enter into this individual ensemble marching and all the things as, as a judge understanding what that's inclusive of. So uh, we filmed this at the Woodlands High School. Joni Perez was so kind to serve on our committee. It's a wonderful band director and, and offered her comments here. And Matthew Rummel uh, is a color guard director. He ran CGT Winter Garden, teaches uh, at Capel, uh, was able to come in and, and offer some comment on the, on the guard side. So let's take a listen to uh, a little bit of their discussion um, about the area visual sheet. Sure, um, I can get into like a lot of the nuts and bolts of what I feel would be a part of um, adjudicating in that area. And one of those is just, you know, the, the students show a simple awareness and understanding of things like spacing between each other in the form as the form develops over time, right? Uh, do they show an understanding of how the form should expand and contract and, and that uh, such those things from set to set? Does a student maintain a consistent step size from the start to the finish of the phrase? And do they understand you know, what it means to travel in a straight line path or in a curved path? Or if it's a follow the leader, it's just a basic understanding of what, what is the form that I'm in and what is my individual responsibility within that form and throughout a phrase. Um, things like maintaining upper and lower body control. Uh, through various tempos, different step sizes, various directions, forward, backward, slide. So you could go on and on about like the nuts and bolts of how, how that all affects, um, you know, their control of form and interval as they move throughout the show. You know, and I think something that we're seeing a lot more of in the past few years is the <laughs> layering of choreography on top of all of those elements as well. You know, so it oftentimes is not the first thing that we think about as teachers, you know, like what is their spacing as they're doing a dance phrase moving across. Mm -hmm. But once we start to get to the area sheet and then eventually as you get to the state sheet, what will set you apart is are you able to do all of those things in your choreographic moments as well as just your straight marching and playing moments. And then on top of that, you know, are you choreographing something while they're playing as well and the those that I think really achieve at a high level are the ones that are able to pay attention to you know their body the form their interval their control of the equipment especially as you're starting to ask them to do more than just straight left right left right marching right that's a great point it got me thinking about actually um, our opening impact in our show from this past year it was a full ensemble choreographed moment with an opening hit and so we went through this whole process of teaching them the movement and defining, you know, every count, every shape. And so, you know, you get that and it's great. And then you put them out on their drill set. And if it's a traveling um, moment of movement, then you have to go back and say, okay, not only on this count does your leg shape need to look like this or your toe or the flex or the point, but you've also got to make sure you have traveled an eight to five step on that count or two eight to five steps past the dot to get back to it. So. You know, that's a great point of when of when you're doing something like choreography and body movement that you, they do understand how that fits within the confines of drill and spacing and form and that there's still an understanding of that as they do that uh, choreographed moment for the effects. Yeah, so I think a great example of the uh, band choreography and maintaining, you know, body control and uh, the control of the equipment in form and interval would be Marcus High School 2017 when they did Prodigy. The last year that they were at Grand Nationals, the first portion of their production, they were on side one in a block and the full band was there for a pretty good amount of time and it was crystal clear. And I think because it was crystal clear, it added so much depth and nuance to the program because they considered all of the details of what they were doing while they were doing band choreography that it just it started them, I think, at a different level 
like having that attention to detail in more than just marching and playing, but making sure they took the band choreography into consideration with that first part of that box, uh, the control of form and interval, control of body, and the control of equipment. Yeah, and things being able to do things like that with your group and teaching them that kind of awareness and that level of detail through simultaneous responsibilities and demands, that's going to be one of the things that sets your group apart you know, from all of the others is when you can look at a particular group and see that it's not just, okay, we're marching this set of drill here, but oh my goodness, there's this whole other uh, you know, responsibility that they're having to have while they're doing X, Y, Z to maintain that level of concentration and clarity and form and detail so that it's communicating clearly upstairs. Which I think as a judge is where we get to the last bullet point of recovery, where that's important. Mm -hmm. Because you could be looking at two groups and you see, let's take Marcus 2017, they have all of that responsibility of the body and the form and it's clear. You see a couple students make a mistake, but then you see them recover. Mm -hmm. That takes training yes. and skill and thought right you know and that that to me when I see that just as an audience member or as a judge or even as another director I think wow that's that's really impressive almost mm -hmm. to a certain extent it it means more to me that they were able to recover in such a right. great way than if they had just done it right the right. first time right and that that goes with like the level of professionalism that you see mm -hmm. um, on you know several parts of the sheet and the poise and you know how that energy is communicating upstairs through the individual level and and that the fact that a student can recover in a situation like that is a huge um, testament to the training that they've had and just the 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 mental space that they're in when they're performing and then i think with regard to the those last four bullet points of the precision and timing demonstration of individual skill or sorry individual style poise presence and communication um, i think a lot about your production new york the last time you guys were at Grand Nationals, the, the responsibility of the performers to be in character mm -hmm. the full time, to demonstrate that individual style and to demonstrate that, well, not just demonstrate, but communicate that character the entire time. They weren't in just a band uniform, they were in a sailor's uniform, they were in a sailor's outfit. So they had an additional responsibility of having to maintain that character the entire time on top of maintaining good form and good control and mm -hmm. great sounds and great marching. You know, so that adds a whole nother layer of responsibility right. that I think as a judge has to be taken into consideration. But then also when you look at recovery, like I would imagine you spent some time talking about how to recover in character mm -hmm. as well to make sure that you didn't suddenly get jolted out of the story and the performance. Right, right. So those are, those are important things, I think, to consider when you're judging, especially as you get towards the back half of the season, like being able to see that, that professionalism mm -hmm. from those students and really take that into account of their ability um, as, a, as a performer and how that, that should really weigh heavily for you. Well, and I think one of the major parts of what everybody needs to understand when they're looking at an individual caption on a sheet is students understand it and the judges understand it, directors understand that the individual contribution, the individual awareness, the unified approach from person to person is, is paramount to what you're going to get upstairs. So both, you know, field and ensemble go hand in hand in that respect. And I think, you know, that gets lost um, sometimes in translation. So, uh, yeah, whatever you can get your individuals to understand at that very fine level and to understand it at the same uh, magnitude from concept to concept and from portion of show to portion of show is going to translate in a really effective way upstairs that's going to be engaging and, and it's going to communicate just really clearly. You know, Jerry, a couple things, and, and I thought it was great that uh, Joni and Matthew were able to expound on some of those ideas, especially be able to see those examples. Uh, I think things that I'm living right now as an instructor, like we're, we're building the show, uh, we're thinking about visual moments that will reinforce. Uh, as an adjudicator, I, I think it's, it's something you should be noticing. Uh, I see somebody moving on the field. Are those the performers that I'm supposed to be looking at that are maybe playing a, playing a feature, for instance? Mm. Or is, are those students kind of standing still, maybe in a posed formation or in just a block of some kind, while there's other performers that are moving on? We all know that this little group right here, the simultaneous responsibilities, they're having to play a high demand moment and maybe do some choreography at the same time. Well, that's at the top of the chain if it's done at a really high level, uh, while maybe it's just being supported by some other groups. And so I know you have your top groups that you're going to be looking at in the conversation as the ones that go on to the state marching contest. Those are the, the things you should 
should be looking for. And of course, excellence is the driving answer in all of those. To what degree do they do that? But you're looking for content along the way. It's okay, especially from an aesthetic standpoint, sometimes just to be standing still. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that if you feel it's appropriate with the soundtrack that we're listening to. But uh, realize there's there will be several uh, evolutions in the last couple of years where performers are doing more and more uh, from the band proper uh, that we have in some of the different areas. Yeah, well said. You got a vamp for another thing. That's right. Uh, we, we we figure it's about every ten minutes the uh, the auto uh, the, the lights go out on us here. Um, but, go ahead. But so yeah, so to jump in, the, the next part of their discussion kind of highlights a little bit about. Mm -hmm. um, when we give performers lots of responsibilities, like maybe there is, I talked a little bit about the, the prop earlier and things like, like when, mm -hmm. when they have tons and tons of responsibilities. So here's another, just a little short clip from them that I thought uh, was a great thing to share with you uh, a little bit about kind of what they experienced from this perspective. So it goes further than just the performers transitioning from prop to prop or the color guard transitioning from onto the field and off to the field and then back on again. Those, those are things that we see constantly. Um, that do need to be attended to if you would like to get that ensemble toward the top half of the sheet or to get your own ensemble to be able to get to the top half of the sheet is attending to all those odds and ends. But for sure, mm -hmm. you know, the, the performers that are moving around props, they're just as integral to the entire performance as mm -hmm. the musicians on the field. In, in 2015, we had, um, this is, you know, if you're gonna go down the big prop route, uh, we had this big um, sundial type thing that we had to move, and sometimes we had to use um, our extra marchers to, to move that, sometimes we used the color guard, sometimes we used our trumpet section, and depending on the musical moment, depending on whether or not you could hide them or not hide them, you know, really determined how we had to teach those kids to move and be a part of that ensemble moment, right? I remember having to get the color guard, having to push this thing that just weighed a thousand pounds, and they had to do it with flowy arms and you know it was just like oh my gosh you know and to try to keep them in character and make it flow and be musical um that's that's just you know those are part parts of a show that that again you you don't want to overlook and then in terms of transitions pauses in between movements and breaks uh you know whether or not um you know students are maintaining or if they're staying involved in the performance during those moments if your color guard is having to have an equipment change and you can't really hide what they're doing with a prop or a you know flat or whatever, um, you know are are they are they moving with a purpose? Are they moving in character? Is there still uh, drill and form control and everything like that as they move into that, or is it just a function of what's going on? Is it do do they lose you from a performance standpoint or from an ensemble moment standpoint? Likewise, in, betw in between um, movements, uh, you know, how do you captivate your audience and engage your audience and have your students demonstrate that we're, we're still, we are still performing for you even though the show has stopped for a moment, right? Or there's a silence or there's a dip in the energy that there's this constant awareness of um, what the ensemble is supposed to be communicating in those times. It's such great advice, too, because I, I know, like, as we work into kind of growing back our programs back from COVID, we're seeing groups. I mean, just in the, the groups I've gotten to see so far this season, there's a, just a lot more use of props, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot more involvement. And, and the performers are being asked not just to march and play. You know, they're being asked their choreographic responsibilities. I feel like each year are higher and higher. I, I totally agree, and I, I, uh, I, I love that there were – kind of getting back to we think this is really going to motivate and uh, stimulate the students. I love that the, uh, the students are buying into it a lot and of course we have several groups of classes that haven't experienced that probably to this degree whether they competed or not but I, 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 I we want we need to reward the groups that are that are trying to take chances we yeah. really do yeah I want to mark and I want to pause and really talk yeah. through the content side of visual because it's probably one of the areas again I, I want to so, so remember when we talked about I think maybe Mike Zeller said it in the previous interview about how on the music sheet 850 points um, yes. And then only 150 come from content. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that in visual it's different? I'm going to go back, uh, back up a little bit here. Watch. So this is the content at 300, mm -hmm. but notice that it's 400 and 300. So 300 of the individual, 400 of the ensemble, 300 of the content. So mm -hmm. content's worth twice as much on the on the visual mm -hmm. side. And so you may say like, well, why? What's there? Why does it look like that? So if you're okay, like he and I, we're just going to talk through some of these descriptors for you. 
effective use of all performing elements. And we've heard that on the music side. We heard Mike Howard talk about that earlier. Right. And now we're coming back around. Um, to you, uh, from a director perspective and from adjudicator perspective, how do you look at that effective use on the visual side about all performing elements? Sure. The, uh, it, it's interesting to think about. You, you have musicians we always think about. We have visual performers. We have color guard. We have dancers. Uh, we, we kind of sift it down to a nickname of furniture. Let's move the furniture around the field. <laughs> And it, it, the furniture has to make sense. Like it, things sometimes become obstacles. Mm. Uh, you have painted yourself in a corner. So you also see on, uh, ensembles they can create a, such a dramatic staging opportunity for people, which I which I love. With that becomes planning. Uh, but the and I think this is more of a latter uh, bullet point. Uh, the the students that are let's say we're having to move something. There, it needs to look like there's a motivation. It mm. Needs to look like there's a reason why they're they're moving to certain spots. And then again, what kind of are they in character? We have a certain theme for the show. Are they staying in character? It's harder to do when you're having to kind of lean forward and really put your body weight into something. But it, 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 there should be a point where they can still be. You know what? I'm contributing to the ensemble rather than being a distraction with where I'm supposed to look at this certain moment. Yeah, yeah. And and that kind of goes hand in hand with our next one, which is that effective effect visual reinforcement of the music is mm -hmm. as we're moving performers around are they moving in such a way as to highlight what we right. want them to hear right. um, I think you may have, and forgive me if I'm stealing this from you that, that the audio matches the video that yes. the soundtrack yes. matches what you see kind of on the on mm -hmm. the stage um, what do you think about that not just the effective visual reinforcement but also a suitability piece how do, like we kind of sure. bun bundle those together what are your thoughts there uh, yeah one thing that comes to mind and, and this is where an adjudicator you can look at sometimes the fastest thing on the field catches our attention, mm. and that could be a good thing or that could be a, a hindrance. Uh, that that could be an area where the, we don't want you to look behind the curtain. We don't have the luxury of don't look, look by here and everything is covered up. But there could be a subtle way things could be moving away. If you don't want us to look over a certain side, it could be where these musicians are playing, where we're trying to really concentrate what we're hearing, and in turn, we want you to notice that there's motivation and overlapping forms or a stage being set up because that could build a lot of a lot of drama in one area where all of a sudden things come to a visual resolution mm -hmm. just like how the music has resolution at the exact same time suitability of visual content um, the if you were to take away all the furniture on the field and all the colors would the show still make sense? Mm. And would it still have a lot of excellence to it? We all have seen those groups before where even you sift it down to just what the students are able to, to execute on the field. We love it and we go, that still makes sense. And then we can actually add to that. If we're having to rely on those only mm. as the, not even just the effect, but in, in turn to get the payoff of what we see visually, then it's probably where the suitability may not necessarily match that. Where we're, we're, we're covering something up. We're covering up the fact that uh, we, we haven't train the students to be at the right level or we've actually designed something where uh, it, the, the, in spite of the students we could still kind of push them out of the way. We don't want that at all. We want to let the instructors know whether it be they're the designers or designers with them that we recognize the levels you went to to totally include the students or let the students motivate and really drive this to the next level. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's super well said. And, and I think, too, as we move on, we'll, we'll kind of keep going forward on this one. But we think about the frequency and demand. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't necessarily love the word demand because that doesn't mean it has to be hard. But just is that appropriate? Is it every time that the trumpets have anything featured, they're standing still on the 50-yard line with the drum line right, right behind them? Or is there a frequency at, to that? And, and kind of hand in hand with that is that next one about continuity and flow. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, how is that pacing set up in such a way? Is it logical? Mm -hmm. Am I looking at places where you want me to look? Are the moments the payoff moments? And they don't mm -hmm. always have to be applause moments, but do those payoff moments resonate for us over the course of the show? Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think, like, from a judging perspective, when you talk to groups about either of those, about the, their frequency of demand or sure. continuity and flow, what are some of the things you find yourself saying? What, one thing I, I definitely notice, is, let, let's say someone has gone to great degree to really try to, the, the term would be produce. I'm trying mm -hmm. to produce every moment. They have created so many hard moments all back to back that they're canceling themselves out. Mm. Like you, you don't recognize it after a while and they don't realize that, okay, we could create this moment. Not that everything has to become transitional in between, but let's keep this next moment simple. Like we're gonna look at the excellence of just moving around the field and look, we can get this form to lock at the right time. It sets things up, it sets things up. And then when we get to the next moment that maybe has a little bit more technique, you have given your audience a chance to breathe rather than the audience is just having to work so hard of like, wow, this is hard, this is hard. As we all know, just when you're, you tell an ensemble, 
wow, this looks really hard. This sounds really hard. We know that's not necessarily a positive attribute. Mm. It should make it be easy. It should be where it's seamless. And we, in, a, in, in the, the term of uh, less is more, really could help out um, some of our, our groups. So when you're looking at that, yes, you're going to reward. You're not just saying you have more things in your talent show than someone else's. It's it's not a, 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 a quantity. Mm. It's really definitely a quality. But you're saying that was just enough, and it's the right proportions of it all that really come to mind. So look at that when you have your groups and say, you know what, that's great. I don't think you have to do as much in those two moments. Let's let this kind of breathe a little bit for our audiences to get a chance to applaud or to your performers to say, you know what, we can now really put more into this next uh, visual moment. Yeah. And, and that last one about coordination and mm-hmm. staging. I don't I don't want directors I, or, or judges to think that this is about who you hired as a drill writer or who you... It's about does the show make sense and does the do things feel like they seem together both musically and visually and then just does the visual package complement itself? Mm-hmm. We're going to hear a little later from uh, I know Jody Rhodes and, and Jarrett Littman have a conversation about this at this when we're talking about the stage sheet in a little while and they talk about you know does everything feel coordinated? If you're doing Rhapsody in Blue, is it a blue flag or is it an orange flag? Oh, and did God. you make that decision? But also in terms of that is is how the music pieces together with it that as Mark said the fastest moving things are aligning with the things you you want us to look at and these are if you're watching this as a director my invitation early season if you haven't already watched your show mm-hmm. with the volume down right right just watch the visual and gone oh i oh where, wow. where am i looking here right without the music in the way and then kind of going back any mm-hmm. anything else on that part of the content sheet yeah uh, let, let's say we have a smaller ensemble. Let's just say it's just one of those years where we just maybe don't have enough. Uh, it's the, the color guard's not as big as it's been. Mm. Uh, it's not the simple template of they just kind of need to live in a, in a border or a frame around the ensemble. Maybe this is the year that they need to be staged up a lot more in the front. They need to be a little bit more involved. There's fewer of them. They could really show off. A couple of them have some expressive uh, dance qualities in addition to be able to spin equipment. Let's get them up there more in the front. The same way with some other sections. No one says you have to all of a sudden use all 100 yards. Mm. You, you can create a stage that's appropriate for you. I think we're getting smarter with that, where we're staging maybe grounded percussion if we have limited numbers in that area. But create a, a concise uh, theatrical stage for yourself. And then it looks like, hey, we worked a lot smarter here. We didn't just say we're going to spread everyone out in the field because we've done it that way for 10 years. The, things have. Uh, th- this is what's needed for this ensemble this year. Yeah, yeah. And so I want to go back to Matthew and Joni's conversation okay. one more time. Um, I thought this was a really good just kind of talk about judging area visual and, and just kind of an, an overall good summation of some ideas to keep in mind as you watch. Let, let's give them uh, one more uh, one more go here. You know, for me, I think this starts with one really simple phrase. If you can hear it, you have to see it. Mm. And that Agreed. that is the bottom line of anything that you would want to start with as both a director and as a judge. So if I hear it, I need to see it. And not only that, but where I hear it is where I need to see it. Yes. When it comes to uh, looking for what you're hearing, you know, if I, if I hear a trumpet feature all of a sudden begin and I'm looking around like where are the trumpets, then obviously there is, there is a disconnect in um, you know, the staging and, and, and where the, that particular section should be. Or if there's a soloist, I can't tell you how many times I watch a show and you hear a soloist coming through the microphone and, you're, and you have no idea where to look and you're sitting here looking and looking and looking and where are they? I hear them, but where are they? And you know, in a moment like that, if you can't do something special with the drill, then you get a color guard member. You get one color guard member to go out there and twirl around that soloist so that you know your your attention is is where it needs to be. So staging is a huge part um, of this caption, and uh, you know determining whether or not the elements are you know cohesively planned um, throughout the production. And I I think how it's represented is also worth discussing. You know more often than not we we'll see a, a really intricate woodwind run maybe being represented by something where the, the visual choreography, both from the color guard or the band, is really locked into the quarter note and not actually representing what we're hearing. So it's not just enough to make sure that 
what you hear and what you see are in the right place, but you've got to make sure that the, the details and the nuance of the musical phrase is also picked up in the writing of the band choreography, in the writing of the color guard choreography, and sometimes that's about making the appropriate choice from a color guard perspective about what equipment is being used there. So if you have a really delicate moment that requires a lot of technical skill from a woodwind ensemble, maybe a big bulky swing flag would not be the best way to pick up that moment. Maybe it could be articulated better with a dance soloist or a saber or a rifle or some sort of prop that fits with the show that can be just as nimble and just as intricate and just as delicate. And I think that that's something that would also you know, lend an ensemble to be more towards the top side of the sheet of being able to say they consistently reinforce the music visually with what we're hearing. Mm -hmm. You know, they took into account that that's a really delicate moment. Or on the opposite side, that moment requires a whole lot of power. So maybe a bigger piece of equipment, bigger, bolder movements, something that's a little bit more athletic in nature as opposed to something that looks a little bit more refined or almost ballet-esque. Right. And when it comes to the part of the sheet that says effective use of all performing elements, one of the things that I would look for is to see if all of the groups in the ensemble are contributing to the whole in a meaningful way. Or are you just leaning on the color guard? Are you leaning on your trumpet section? Are you leaning more on your woodwind section? Um, and so you, you want to look to see if all of the performers are being asked to perform at the same level, given the same demands, the same expectations, um, and so that you're, you're, you're showing strengths through the entire group and not just kind of these little subgroups that would maybe uh, unintentionally communicate that, you know, hey, not all of these uh, students out here have been trained at the same level or have been given, you know, the appropriate information uh, to, to get them all to the same level. And I, I do think that you, you started to key in on something there about talking about uh, what the entire ensemble is doing. Let's, let's say we have a woodwind feature going on down at the front, you know, the front of the field. You do have to take into consideration how everything else impacts that, both as a judge and a designer. You know, and, and oftentimes you'll get a drill writer where things are just kind of moving and it's kind of your responsibility. It is your responsibility as a director to figure out how to make sure that you have a multiplicity of events that really brings your eye to what it needs to be because of what you're hearing. You know, so taking into account which way are they facing? You know, what kind of choreography are they doing? Do you take a moment and just kind of pause them and clump them up and it gives some sort of a textural quality that they can then move out of after that? And I think a really well-balanced program that would be hitting the consistently and always portion of the sheet is someone that's going to take into account how everything is working together mm -hmm. based on what you hear, whether it's a big right. moment or a soft moment or anything and how you're coordinating those events and the groups that you're going to be able to reward more or the groups that will think about this are, are the ones that will be able to be rewarded more. I think about New York. You know, there were multiple moments in New York where you could see little vignettes of things happening on the backside of the field that almost like theater, it just added right. so much more interest because you're like, wow, they even thought through those performers in the back, the, the last five flags, how they looked and how they contributed to the performance and how that related to the soloist that was down front. And on that, that allows, I would think, for your program, if we were using these new descriptors, to be in the always section of the sheet because you were always attending to those little details and making sure that those last five flag performers were supporting that small ensemble mm -hmm. moment or that soloist that was happening up front, as opposed to distracting from. Absolutely. And I think one way that you, as a, as a director, could do this, and when you're judging, that one way you can assess this is, no, don't look in the obvious places, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so easy for uh, some judges and directors to to stare at what's right in front of them, or when you're up on your tower, you know, you're you're you tend to look what's it right in front of you, and if you can force yourself as a judge, as a director, to to look in those places, look off on the sides, look out in the edges, in the back corners, way up on the front side line, on the extremities to see if if the whole picture has been addressed and if if there's anything that's been left behind and kind of just tossed aside or if, if the whole package is working together and that there's an obvious commitment to um, communicating whatever it is you're trying to get across musically and visually through every single element every single moment is that a challenge yes i mean that it definitely takes time it takes a lot of eyes and a lot of watch it again and videos and, and things like that. But as a judge, you have to be able to look all the way across the field and assess whether or not 
you know, all those things are being addressed. Um, and, and, and if you see that, then you're going to have more of that. Mm -hmm. I'm always seeing this through line. I'm always seeing this commitment to professionalism, to uh, the, the, the concept, to the, the movement, uh, the music, the drill, wh whatever. You know, I, a personal run in with this. The first year that I got to Capel, we were really dealing with rebuilding the color guard. And so we relied heavily on using band members to fill the back half of the flag line. And we went to a contest and the judge, much to my benefit, paid attention to the 10 kids up front that were superb. And they did not pay attention mm. to all of our vulnerabilities that were happening on the back. Mm -hmm. Now that, to the other programs that were way more coordinated than we were, did not turn out well for them because we weren't working with a judge that was looking at that holistic package. So I benefited that day from a judge that didn't take all of those things into consideration, but what it, you know, from, from a very selfish perspective, it actually allowed me time to go, oh man, the discrepancy of the skill level and contribution from the front half of the field is not anywhere near what's going on in the back half, and that's something that I had to put a lot of time into. Um, but I, I think that if I were looking at this now, and you were judging my program with everything that you had said, there's no way that I could have gotten anywhere above the middle of the usually category, mm -hmm. just with how lopsided my attention was to the front of the field to the back. Yeah, I kind of jumped out of Matthew's quote there, but but I mean, I think it's such a great point as an adjudicator, our responsibility to be sure that we see everything, mm -hmm. that we're looking not just where you would like for us to look, mm -hmm. but we're also looking at the places you might hope that we don't look, that we are looking at those flags across the back, mm -hmm. uh, that we're talking to, to Color Guard. I mean, maybe we could take a second here just to sure. say, like, I'm going to share with, with our judges, with our area and state judges, a little bit of a, a document we prepared on the TMAA side. We started using it at the region trainings to talk specifically um, just kind of about how you talk to Color Guard if maybe that's not your background. Sure. And it's not my, I don't think it's in your background. No, it, it can be intimidating sometimes because of the terminology, what they're doing, we know it's together or not together, we don't know what to call it though. Mm. The, the, uh, the judging term you were, you were referring to earlier is sampling. Yeah. We need to be sampling everyone in the field. We need to show that we value everyone's contribution to this performance. Give them more than just, oh, you're holding a really pretty flag which they had no choice in the matter. Right. It's your performance has really enhanced this, or I really appreciate it. And you're always scanning. You're always scanning all the, the performers in the front, not just locked in, but in the back, in the side, looking to the sides. Keep, keep active, especially in your commentary. Yeah, great. Well, we're going to take a, a little break as we take this quiz. So this is quiz number three, and you are halfway through the training. We've gotten to kind of the conclusion of the area sheet. We're, going to, we're starting to talk about area when we come back from the break. We're going to talk about formulating your number mm -hmm. and some advice about how to get that number to lock in. And then we're going to spend the last bit of our training talking about the state sheets. So with that, the time is currently uh, on my end, 3.01. So why don't we go ahead and take about a five-minute break. Uh, we'll be back at 3.06. Please take this quiz during the break, and we'll resume our broadcast here in just about five minutes at about 3.06. We might come back a minute early and just chat. So sure. if you hear us talking, just that's your cue to start heading back our way. Thanks so much.
All right. We're uh, we're still about a minute from coming back in. I'm just hopefully you're. Thank you for lots of comments. Some of you are texting us. We appreciate that. Don't start <laughs> texting if you haven't, but that's fine. <laughs> and uh, and lots of good comments online about just how much you're learning from this. And, and we we really hope uh, it's helping. I know that. Uh, when we asked, and I have to say, when we asked Mike or, or Robert, when we asked Joni uh, yeah. to serve in these, and you'll see Jared later and Ronnie Rios, like it was, everybody jumped at the chance yeah. um, to get it, it, to talk. Absolutely. They just went, I would love to do this. And they wanted to, wanted to be a part of the, uh, the contribution to the program. Yeah. And I, I think that just shows the commitment, the way that our judges are, you know, about wanting to grow what goes on in marching band in Texas. I, I had a chance to watch, um, and, and I, I certainly think the world of what was going on in the 90s and 2000s, mm-hmm. and I watched the, what we're asking of our performers today. Mm-hmm. It's pretty crazy. It really I is. mean, kids were doing incredible things then, yeah. but what they're doing now is, like, right. unbelievable. Yeah, so much more demand, and we just kind of assume that they, they can do it, and yeah. it, it's crazy <laughs> that we keep putting them in those situations. They're, it's effective, but it, it has definitely evolved. Absolutely. Well, so – now we're getting to the well i mean it's it's what you're hired to do yes the commentary is is eight minutes you know nine minutes of you talking to the group but the number um is is super important and so i thought we'd talk just a little bit about this and then we're going to seek advice from a veteran judge in a uh, in a little uh, broadcast here so the first is um when you're establishing that number match all of the elements to that descriptive adjective that always the the consistently your spreads between groups should aim to have meaning. If you have a group that's, uh, you know, again, we're talking about out of a thousand points, right? If you have a group right. that's within 10 points out of a thousand, those groups should be pretty close. If you have a group that's 400 points out of a thousand, mm-hmm. those groups should be very distant. There should be some meaning to the, the gap you're putting in between groups and not just gapping them by a couple. And we'll talk a little bit about, about how to do that. But once the standards, these are examples of greatness, um, of the top category are understood, then everything else kind of falls in line. And we're going to hear from our, our, our guest here in a moment a little bit about kind of how that works for him is establishing. I think he uses the term anchor groups. Yes. You find that anchor, and then from that anchor, you build the rest of your scoring structure. So this is something I think that we all need a good refresher on. And so, again, we're going to invest just about the next 20 or 30 minutes talking about how do I come up with my number? If you see, uh, if you hear someone refer to the fancier term of a paradigm, mm-hmm. that's the same thing as an anchor group. That's that's the group, that's your benchmark, that you're basing. That's a solid, consistently placed uh, ensemble there. That's where I can use them throughout the day. It always is my reference point. So when you hear those used, they are used interchangeably sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I'm going to go back to this. You remember this from our discussion earlier. We talked about impression, analysis, and comparison. But now we're getting to the area level, and we're adding some more tools on the bottom. We've now talked about adding the using the thirds. Sorry, Mark and I's picture is in your way, guys. I'll get that out of there for you. <laughs> You're like, get out of the way. Hey, come on, guys. <clears throat> we don't need to see you all anymore. Mm-hmm. We already know who you are. All right, there we go. Um, and so now we can talk about using thirds. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about numerical scale, and we showed how the five boxes are broken down into 15 mm-hmm. boxes. We haven't talked too much about things like value of a tenth, caption integrity. Mark did mention a little bit, uh, I think, earlier about profiling. Maybe I remember that. Um, and so, you know, we're going to continue to delve into what do those mean to me as an adjudicator mm-hmm. to ensure that I come up with a number that represents not only my commentary, but the performance of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so let's dive into maybe some some useful tips. Let's talk about I, this third. I love this one a lot. This has helped me uh, so much. I use this same technique when I am judging the TMEA Allstate uh, individual process. Mm. I create my boxes into thirds, and in turn, when I'm having incredible individual performers, I use the exact same concept with this. Yeah, so so let's talk about using thirds. I'll maybe read to you a little bit, and then I'll, I'll let Mark dive in mm-hmm. um, and get us out of the way again there. So... The, the lower third of the box. Let's say that I'm investing. I, I feel like this group, when I was doing my tick marks, I asked those questions. I kind of put where they were. And I'm, I'm putting them in the lower third of the box. What does that mean? And I use the term emergence. Mm-hmm. It's a bridge to the next lower box. They're not in that next. They're not in the usually box. They're in the consistently box. But the band will display most of the components inside of, again, let's say consistently right now, most of the components. However, there could be a couple of those questions you answered that puts you over in usually. Right? Yeah, and and that, could, that could look a, a couple different ways with a snapshot. It could be certain sections 
are pretty solidly into a certain mm -hmm. part where certain ones aren't. It could be certain descriptors, like the group has great uh, technical demand and plays precisely together, but yet it's still lacking in musicianship or effective dynamics, for instance. Or it could be the woodwinds are super strong, the brass are pretty good, but the percussion is kind of in the lower box. So it could take on a couple different angles just depending on how your sheet is set up. Yeah. Yeah, and so this is, you know, I, I always think, too, in this bottom thing that I wrote here is you may be unclear about whether they're actually in that next lower box probably halfway exactly. through the show. Yeah. You're like, oh, gosh, maybe they're in usually, yeah. but maybe they're in consistently. I'm, I'm not sure exactly where I have them. And as the show progresses and they get into the end of it, they, they really kind of cement their number. So now the middle third. The middle third is realization. The band displays pretty much all of the attributes inside of that box. To be in the middle, um, there's not a lot of distinction into the lower box and not a lot into the upper box either. You just feel like they're squarely inside of that consistently range. Mm -hmm. what, what would you like to add on that? Yeah, it, 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 solidly right in the middle. Sometimes it's just kind of, kind of spot on. Yeah, there could be a couple little outliers, but generally when you, they're performing over the course of time, Everything they're doing is at the very uh, the same level of consistency, same level of excellence. Uh, maybe the show is designed at the same level, uh, the exact same way with performers. Uh, I, I'm able to look across the board. Everyone has an equal number of this. Yeah, there's probably a star soloist mm. uh, visually or musically, but but they, that group there, and in some ways that could be my uh, anchor group. Mm. That could be an anchor group that I choose to come up with where you're circling, you know, the, the middle of that when that is a, a group that's in the realization part of the box. Okay, that's that's my bottom of the third. That's my bottom or the right in the middle of the usually box, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, and this last, we're in the upper third, fulfillment. That means some of the components are displayed with a distinction that leans to that higher box. Mm -hmm. So as a band displays more of the components, again, we've been talking about consistently, inside of consistently, but you're seeing some things that are just always good. And like mm -hmm. you said earlier, maybe it's just a particular section mm -hmm. that's trending that way for you. Maybe it's inside of one of the productions is trending more toward always, right. but, but things kind of fall into that consistently for the majority of time. So that what about the fulfillment box? Jerry, when they, I think when I have the area and I'm discussing this top of the box, I find myself, these are some of the difference makers mm -hmm. for the group that's going to potentially be named the outstanding group at that contest, or if it's at an area uh, sheet, judging to the state sheet, that's the difference between the second band that gets to go on that fulfillment level versus a group that's a solid group. Well, they, they play well, they march well, the audience loves them, but they just are maybe lacking in the fulfillment level as well as the other group. I find myself many times when I'm circling that on the sheet, that becomes some of my most critical decisions. Mm. And in turn, it takes the weight off my shoulders. I go, that's the spot right there that, that gives that group of the group the edge. Both are outstanding, but that one's going to get the nod. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to play this game with you for a second. Um, let's just say I put event 1 through 10, and let's just say you were scoring on a scale of, I put 90 at the top and 55 at the bottom, right? And let's just say their first moment was here, second moment, third, oh, that was really good. Oh, boy, they struggled getting into the ballad. Oh, it was really, the hit wasn't together. Mm -hmm. uh, the closer got better and better, but just kind of lost energy at the end, right? We might see this performance arc from a group. And so again, we're thinking about how to divide them in the thirds, but then we're also looking at performance arcs that vary. Mm -hmm. um, let's pick a second band, right? Oh, <laughs> Here's wow. a band a who's visual decrescendo. Right, right yeah. started the, the season real strong. Kids remember the drill, but maybe the teaching and the training isn't where it needs to be. Eligibility kicked in, relearn the show. Right, and, and, and so over the course of that, and, and don't worry, I'll share how these play out numbers wise, but I, I know we've all judged these groups, oh, yes. right? We've all judged that that first group and we've all judged that second group here's a third group all the ensemble 2d moments are dynamite yeah but all the stuff that connects the 2d moments sure. is really problematic for them sure right like, that group has been the most consistent of the three you've shown so far well let's see if mark's yeah. right i yeah. think he might be <laughs> and so there you go so i took my numbers and i said this is where i had band one and again this it you don't need to be this scientific but right. i just wanted to show this to you as an example of how you might see those groups and you may i'm going to go back up to my graph you may look at group one and go boy they had that really great moment i mean they they were pinging 90 almost yeah. right off the bat, but boy, the, the second part of the show, group two started pr stronger than group one did, mm -hmm. but just by a little bit, but never really had that stuff. Whereas 
Group number three had some things taken care of, but mm. there's still some room for growth on the end. And you can see there that, that Mark was right, that, that band three edged out uh, bands one and two on that because those moments were together. And again, we can't all be that scientific about right. it. It, it, it. It doesn't work like that. But I wanted to just show that to you, an example of as you're thinking about those ticks, that it's not just going to be so easy to say, definitely middle of here, definitely here. Right. It's, it's that sliding scale that you're constantly kind of having to manage. And then, Oh, yeah. And then we also have to think about the content. Yes. So it's not just about that that moment was that good for you, but also what was the challenge yes. that was involved in that moment? Were they doing choreography or were they standing still? And so it, it really, I mean, if anything, this is what scares me as a judge is I have to manage all of these things. Yes. Well, in the profile you're discussing there, you can see uh, band one, we, we loved it. You know, it was, it was really cr across the board pretty consistent. Band three, the 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 sports car was not quite as fancy. Right. But boy, they sure understood the performance of it. They understood how to drive that car a lot better. You could see Band 2, it's a pretty fancy machine, but boy, they are just struggling along right. the way. Now, I did it, and just full transparency, I did this on a state setup mm -hmm. where it's 50-50 mix. But mm -hmm. if you remember, we talked about in the area music sheet, it's <laughs> 850 to 150, yeah. or in the area visual sheet, it's 700 to 300. So my proportions right. would be different in considering what versus how I just happen to do the state one because it's easier mathematically, so right, absolutely. Um, but just something to think about. And so uh, I'm gonna go back up to that as I transition out. So uh, let's go back over here for just a second. I wanna tell you uh, a little bit about our next guest because I don't know how many of you uh, have a chance to know Ted Wemhoff. Mm -hmm. uh, Ted is a, a DCI judge. He judges DCI with Mark and I, uh, color guard on the visual and general mm -hmm. effect captions. WGI. He's, he's yeah. judged WGI World Championships. Um, but Ted's not a band director. Yeah. And when we were talking about somebody to come in to talk about numbers, uh, we had a couple of folks visit with us. We actually visited with Albert Lowe. And mm -hmm. I apologize, we're not sharing a lot of Albert. This is a lot of Albert's info. Right. <laughs> uh, we, we, we weren't able to share his interview. But uh, but he gave us a great interview. And then, and then we had Ted come in and mm -hmm. talk with us. And so what I did on Ted's is I broke it down into a bunch of little kind of small clips of him offering some advice as a veteran DCI, as a veteran uh, WGI adjudicator. But the other thing I want you to know about Ted is he's a band, he's a Texas band parent. That's right, yeah. Right? He's had three boys go through the, the Wakeland program, and I think that hearing Ted talk about what that means to his sons, because I, I, I know that a lot of us have had our kids yeah. go through our program. band programs, and, and, and it definitely, I know for me, uh, you know, changed my perspective on how I think about some of these things. And so let me share a little bit of, of Ted's stuff with you. I think you'll really like some of the uh, advice that, that he was uh, able to share with me. Here we go. So obviously you want to scout out your area, right? Do you have enough room to set out all your sheets? Do you have enough room for any, you know, documentation you need to be to reference while you're judging? You want to make sure you have a clear um, view of the field. If you're, like I'm a visual judge, but I, I uh, would rather be somewhere where I can hear well, right? Because the connection from audio to visual is very, very important. So if they put me in a room where I'm behind glass, obviously I, I want to be I'd rather be in the stands mm -hmm. than be behind glass. So, you know, just make sure that everything that you're comfortable because you're going to be there for a long time and you want to make sure that you can uh, be in the best position to give your best for, you know, the units on the field. I mean, I think it's really important as adjudicators to let the, the performers decide, right? The performers get to decide who wins that day. Um, so you have to always give the nod to the performers, right? Regardless of everything else. Now there's going to be other contest dynamics or there's going to be dynamics within um, different show design, things like that. But you always want to give the nod to the performers. Um, you know, a, a show could have some faults to it, right? Compared to its competitor. But if the kids really bring it that day and they have that once in a lifetime performance and you can tell that they're riding that wave, they deserve to get that nod, mm. right? So that's what, what, when I hear somebody say, judge the show of the day, that's the way I look at it. And then, you know, that comes into focus when a judge is looking at how they're profiling based on, on the sheets. It's okay for the performers to outperform the show, so mm. to speak, right? So it's, a, it's important to not allow yourself get uh, sort of drugged down into exactly what, um, uh, how do I put this? The design of the show, so to speak, right? I mean, that's important. That's an important aspect of the show, obviously. Um, but the performers ultimately are the ones that are bringing it to life. So they're the ones that deserve deserve the credit and they deserve that nod. 
I mean, I always go into it um, wanting to make recordings that can be played for the students, right? To make sure that, um, I don't want to say dumb down my commentary, but make sure that my commentary is relatable, even to, you know, first time band directors, newer instructors, um, the, the students themselves. Try to make sure if I have comments that are directed directly to the students that I make sure that they know that I am talking directly to them. Hey students, it's your responsibility to do X, Y, and Z here. And your instructors have given you a wonderful opportunity. Now you need to take advantage of it. You know, those types of things. So they know and they feel uh, that they are, you know, a part of and being directly communicated to hmm. um, through my commentary. Yeah. So. Every um, style is, you know, valuable, has value to it, and you have to be able to assign value to it. Um, and as a, an adjudicator, you know, you just don't step into the seat and expect to be able to, you know, throw numbers out. You have to educate yourself. And that goes, you know, to watching different types of, you know, theater, exposing yourself to different types of art and being comfortable in bring in taking those things in and understanding them and and knowing that they have value, right? There's not one style that trumps another. Core style doesn't trump military style doesn't trump, you know, show band. It all again, it comes down to what's on the field and how is it delivered? What do the kids do that day in order to bring the show to life that was provided to them? Hmm. So, so yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that I'm constantly working on, right? Because, you know, it's really easy to see one little thing and get very bogged down with, you know, one particular aspect of, you know, a transition, a specific transition, or, you know, a soloist, or just any one item within a show, it's easy to get bogged down on. You really have to, I, I tend to zoom in and zoom out. So I'm, you know, I'm focusing in on particular areas, and then I just make sure that every once in a while I'm reminding myself that I have to really zoom out, take a look at the entire field, all of the elements and how they're coming together, and then also think about what has progressed since the beginning of the show up till now. You know, because things like pacing and just all of those uh, elements that bring a show together from beginning to end, you have to allow those things to evolve over time. You can't, uh, you can't just start commenting on things like pacing within the first 30 seconds of the show, right? <laughs> um, you know, there is pacing within a phrase or pacing within, you know, a transition. You know, you can talk about those things, but you have to be specific about making sure you're talking specifically about those things. But you have to let things evolve in front of you and let them come to you, right? And sort of be open to whatever the, the unit is or the team is, is bringing to you. That's a tough one, because that's also another one that, you know, I find myself, even after all these years, having to, you know, check myself on to make sure. Um, I always like to sort of almost, it's almost like a, a mental checkbox. When I see something, you know, or I want to comment on something like a transition or a development into an impact, the delivery, you know, talk about the development, you can talk about the design aspect, but you always need to follow that up with how is it delivered? Mm -hmm. You know, how is it delivered? Musically, how was it delivered from a, you know, a visual standpoint? What did the kids do, either good or bad, to make that a better moment in time, right? Um, it's always important to, you know, because every element within a show, it comes down to how it's delivered, mm -hmm. right? The how is very, very important. You can't tell what the what is sometimes without the how being there. Right. <laughs> right. So it's important that, uh, that that way the designer and the band director gets a little information, the kids are gonna get information on how they delivered it, and the band director also gets information on what can I do to make sure that the kids are you know, delivering that, that moment in time. Yeah, I, I'll generally open with what before I do how. I mean, sometimes I start with how, um, but most of the time I'll start with the what, especially, as you said, in, in challenging moments, right? It's, it's important to recognize, um, one, what the students are trying to achieve, what they're being asked to achieve, mm -hmm. and two, the designer wants you to see what they're trying to get the students to achieve, right? You know, so it's important to kind of let both of those elements that bring a show together know that you saw and you appreciate what they did. Now, that doesn't mean that they did it perfectly well. It means that there could be improvement, and you can you know mention those things, but it's important to, to know. And, and that, again, comes from 
um, one, just experience and seeing and being able to recognize what's difficult, what's more challenging, what isn't. You know, do you have a trained ear? Like, I don't have necessarily the trained ear of a musician to, to be able to pick up all the intricacies of, of some musical phrases. But um, I can tell when, you know, brass are trying to, you know, do double or triple tonguing phrases. I can tell where they're staged, that it's a feature moment. So, you know, how that impacts the overall um, the show from, from a, you know, a content standpoint is, you know, something that I need to, um, to mention, yeah. comment on. Yeah. So, you know, I, I do use those words. Um, you know, we have some different words. We have what's called a bloom, which takes these types of words and gives us other words we can use as well that put in, put us in that same sort of scoring specific commentary. Um, but yeah, I mean, what you say, obviously, as a judge is important. Um, so if you are constantly saying, great, great, awesome, perfect, fantastic, and then you give us you give a, you know, a low score, they have a right to question, you know, what your thought process is, right? So you do have to be careful about what you say. Um, but, and it's important to, to balance because there's gonna, be, there's gonna be some of those great moments in a show and there's gonna be some of those, you know, sometimes or usually you're, you're, you're in that, that lower aspect and you have to sort of balance those out. And I know for, for me, um, I use my commentary not just to provide information to the units and to the students, but also as sort of a verbal check in my head because it allows me to know exactly where I'm, where I'm at numbers wise. I'll get you know, a minute into a show based on my commentary. I can already tell about where, you know, we're, we're getting close to like a box range of, of where that, that unit is. They could move up, they could move down. It really depends on how things continue to progress. But you, know, you get into a cadence of the, the language that you use and it's a sort of a verbal cue for what your numbers are going to end up being. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. I mean, I can think of a number of times um, at uh, World Championships, I've put, you know, groups in box four or high box four in, if I'm talking like with a, a WGI sheet, in the how caption and then in the what, the kids were just fantastic and I put them well into box five or, you know, and maybe at the top of the class, in there uh, for that particular for that particular round or whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's yes, you have to be able to be comfortable with profiling. Yeah. Judging is and numbers management is a little bit of an art, right? Mm -hmm. I mean you have to know you have to sort of game plan before you get there. You have to know how many units you're going to be adjudicating. You have to know how many numbers you have mm -hmm. realistically to use because you're not going to start at a one, right? Obviously, you're going to start somewhere. Um, so you have to sort of know what that range is and kind of how comfortable you are and what your tolerances are going to be between. And, you know, you let your let the boxes be the guide, right? Mm -hmm. And the descriptors in those boxes be the guide. If they're squarely in the middle of box three based on the descriptors, then that's where they are. And, you know, use those descriptors and try not to... Um, judge to the bottom line number, mm -hmm. judge to the subcaption, right? And put your subcaptions down first and then total it all up. If it ends up in a bottom line tie, then you can go back and make some finer adjustments. Right. Um, but if you, if you start by trying to go from the, the bottom line number backwards into your subcaptions, I just don't think the, I don't think you're using the system correctly. Right. Yeah. And I've, I've gotten to gotten into a habit of almost starting with my, my, um, how number first with the student number first right thinking based on that performance where would i stack these that 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 performance up against every other performance mm -hmm. and then start and then work my way but you know and then take talk about the um that that sort of how caption so it it sort of uh, refocused me on how much the kids how much it means to the kids mm -hmm. and how much work the kids put in, right? And that's why I'm, I, I, I very much want to make sure that the, you know, the kids are getting as many accolades, as many points as that, that I can give them, right? Because they put in a lot of work, right? You know, band directors put in a lot of work, designers put in a lot of work, I get it. But the kids are the ones that are 
the drivers, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, ultimately, they're the ones that decide. Doesn't matter how, you know, who designs the show, how much, you know, rehearsal you've done. At, at, that, at that time, at that performance, it's all, about, it's all about the kids, right? It's mm-hmm. completely in their hands. And I think what it's done for me is it's really, you know, brought me back to that realization that um, this activity is for the kids, mm-hmm. right? And it and it and it needs to always be about about the kids. And um, you know, I think if that's at the center of everything, then everything always I think works out well. Because um, there's nothing better. It doesn't matter to you know if 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 a band is successful or not successful. You can always go into the stands at a contest. And the kids from the first place band to the last place band look like they're having a fantastic time, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what the activity is about. Um, I always like to tell my kids, because I you know, was a drum corps guy, met my wife in drum corps. I always tell my kids, this activity means so much to me because without it, like you wouldn't exist, my kids wouldn't exist, <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't have the life that I have, right? With my wife and my family. So. Um, I don't know. It's it's just a special activity, and you know, seeing my kids go through it uh, just sort of reinforce that uh, how special it is. Awesome. Well, I I really loved Ted's discussion and just kind of everything he shared. We I was telling Mark I feel like we pulled together some of the elements he and I talked about before we started talking about sheets and everything about just knowing your environment and establishing those norms, all the way down to. You know, just kind of how you come up with those numbers and balancing your commentary mm-hmm. across the what and the how and, and, and how you do that. Um, I've shared quiz number four with everybody. Uh, it's in the chat, I believe, and it is here uh, as well on the screen for your QR code. There are five quizzes in total. This is your second to last quiz. Everybody's doing great. Keep it up. You're passing. I was going to say uh, mm-hmm. quiz number two, the... Uh, you can take it as I talk. I'm not saying anything important right now. <laughs> uh, quiz number two, it looks like our average was a 95. Well, we slipped a little bit on quiz two, the visual quiz. <laughs> quiz uh, number three is still rolling in, but our points dropped off a little bit more. We're, we got a B rise, on that rise one. Rise above your instruction. You can do this. <laughs> and I, I'm feeling like I'm not uh, staying consistent as a teacher. <laughs> And so far on quiz four, uh, it's 100, but we've only had four people four complete responses. it so far. So... Uh, we'll give you guys a little bit of Best time. Of luck. Yeah. Um, for those of you who are finished, and you can kind of tune us out if you want, we uh, we're we're aiming to we're in the last uh, ninety or so minutes. We'll probably finish really close to time. We had said five, and we'll be sure. we'll be either right on or maybe a little before it. Um, and uh, this next big block of time, we're going to talk about state. Uh, and the new state sheets for 5A and 6A. Mm -hmm. So remember, if you're like, man, these guys spent a ton of time on area, well, remember that area is not just area, but it's also 1A, 2A, 3A, and 4A state. So, you know, when we talk about the the number of contests, there's a whole lot uh, based on those two sheets, Uh, but specifically for 5A, 6A. And so you may say, well, but I'm an area judge, and and I, you know, I'm not having a group that's advancing the state if you're, you know, maybe you're retired. you know, what's, what's, what's my point in staying on and finishing this? And I think that for me, I, w- I want to know what I'm setting them up for. Right. What kind of feedback can I give as an area adjudicator to ensure that those groups are as highly successful at state as they can be? I, I think some of you have caught some of the parallels with this, but we, uh, there, there is a progression. It's the same terminology, but let's say if I was judging area music, each of those little separate captions, now that becomes its own sheet. And you, the next uh, opportunity they get at state for someone to really just dedicate 100% of their focus to that. So it's really your accuracy of information or moving ahead of this is an area I want you to be looking at, uh, whether it be concern or excellence or or just because you keep keep being great. Uh, that's the the next progression. And I would love to see did my comments match up with those chosen to be at the state level? Did it make sense when we got to that area? Uh, when we got to the final thing in San Antonio. Yeah, and, and like if I judged area music and I just isolated my woodwind number off mm-hmm. my sheets, yeah. is that how the woodwind sheets fell with the groups right. that I advanced to state? Did they stay in that same order? How was the spacing between? So, yeah. um, you yeah. know. Well, I think it, I think it's harder to judge area because you're still, you're juggling so many mm-hmm. uh, responsibilities at that time. Uh, I don't know the percentage, but probably 75 to 80% of the 
the groups that we're discussing at, con at, at this, uh, the, the, all, the process that we have all three levels are affected the most at this level, as well as the adjudicators. There's that bigger percentage that it really is honed in there. But uh, we, we put a lot of time into this to make this the next level. The first time ever there will be caption judging at the uh, state marching contest. Yeah, for 5A and 6A. And for so, um, and, and I know for my 1A through 4A colleagues, this is something that, you know, we'll continue to discuss. I know in talking with, with Brad Ken, it's something that will be put to a discussion. And, and maybe there would be a, a time when the 4A, the 3A, the 2A, or the 1A class might also want to begin to move uh, into this type of judging system. So with that, um, Mark and I are actually going to cover the first sheets with you um, before we uh, before we go into the, the percussion sheet. It'll be after this. But um, we're going to talk a little about music ensemble, about mm -hmm. woodwinds and brass. Mm -hmm. um, and so the front of these sheets looks a little different. First off, you notice the sheets turn 90 degrees. Uh, it's in landscape and it's divided into a left side and a right side. The left side focusing on content, the right side focusing on achievement, and that same list of descriptors across the bottom mm -hmm. looks just as it did. Now it's a 50-50 balance between them and I'm just kind of scrolling through as I talk. Mm -hmm. The woodwind sheets, uh, and the brass sheets um, all the way through. There's the percussion ones and again we'll we'll talk about those in just a little mm -hmm. bit. Let me go back up here though. Sorry I'm gonna, I don't mean to jump around on you guys. I know that's rude of me. Um, but let's talk a little bit just about uh, some of the music ensemble sheets and some of the things that you're going to be looking for inside of that. Mm -hmm. um, so when we dive into this we're talking about things like the the coordination and effective use of all performing elements and you're like oh I think Mike Howard talked about that earlier and, and you're right we talked about that at the area level. You know all of these read through through uh, on that content side um, where we're building up from a music ensemble perspective. So if I'm judging just music ensemble at state, tell me a little bit about what are the things that you're listening for on the content side? What are the things that you're listening for on the achievement side? Sure. I, I think this one is the closest related to what we do as being a band director. It's hmm. the one where you're trying to put all of the elements together. You uh, you do have to think about what the brass in comparison to the percussion. It's the electronics. It's mm. the woodwinds. It's the soloists that are being mic'd. Uh, it, it's the whole package put together. So a lot of responsibility on this sheet. Uh, I like to think about uh, standard ensemble objectives. It, uh, are there, is there precision uh, being executed at the same time? Is there proper balance? Do, mm -hmm. do I hear everything? Like if I were to close my eyes right now, would I understand the hierarchy of here's the melody, here's the secondary voice? Uh, do I hear recovery being happening? That's a huge benefit from an ensemble. Like some of the best groups in the world can, re re uh, uh, can recover quickly, and we want to be able to value that along the way. So you're able to... to get the content part of it. This, this thing has been kind of put together in a real unique way that features groups that also when the full uh, 2D ensemble is being performed, I can hear some transparency. I can hear the balance. I can hear the melody. Um, Rich Armstrong had alluded to that when he was referring to Andy's groups at Hebron. You can just, you can hear all the voices, not just the trombone section. And then of course, as we talked about the 50-50 balance, the how. Are the students really bringing this to life and are they executing that at the highest level when they're thinking about an, any uh, what their role is in, in the uh, musical scoring composition. Yeah, and, and two inside of that, I, I think that I tend to, when I'm thinking about that content and achievement, I'm always weighing things across the margin. Mm -hmm. I'm going, I see a moment and I think that there's excellence inside of a moment at state, and then I ask, how challenging was that moment? Yes. Did they maximize that? And then vice versa, when I see a moment that's maybe not as solid, I also think like, was there a design flaw? Was that, and I think Ted talked about this, Wemhoff about, you know, did the, was, it was the show of the day, did the performers bring it, mm -hmm. you know, to me. But, but I like the way you said, it's about being a band director. Mm -hmm. You really know, the is. ensemble sheet is about being a band director. And I'll say, as your group prepares <laughs> to move from area to state in that, you know, nine, 10 day window that you have, I really hope, and, and leading up to it, <coughs> I hope that you will turn the video off for a second and just listen to the audio file mm -hmm. you know and just hear what your group is putting up for you and say like yeah that's that's where I want that to be that sounds the way that I would like it to regard don't let the visual interfere mm -hmm. um, kind of in your thoughts there um, I zoomed in on the sheet uh, Cody I saw your comment I hope that helped uh, to get that a little bit clearer I could zoom in a little tighter I suppose but uh, hopefully that gets you a little bit closer to it uh, on that one let's talk for a second about um, Wobbins and Brass so yes. this is in, and, and I, I'd especially say it's interesting from a woodwind perspective, the idea that we're judging woodwinds at state. Well, um, right, right off the bat, this, this is what makes this unique. We are, we are not a drum corps. 
Right. You know, we, we have this incredible group of musicians in colors and uh, different colors of crayons in the crayon box yeah. that we finally get to use. And so we're going to give those musicians as much credit as possible where it doesn't stand alone different than a DCI sheet where it's obviously irrelevant because of the, the way the nature right set up. Yeah. And so we're, in Woodwinds, we're talking about things like, again, the coordination of all performing mm-hmm. elements. You go, oh, yeah, I remember that from the area sheet. Um, the suitability of the content, the frequency and demand of movement while playing, content with respect to challenge, continuity, and then the effective use of all performers. Mm -hmm. That's that design package. And I liked that, uh, you know, it was said earlier that, and I think this was on the the panel with Andy and Rich uh, and Randy, where they were talking about, if you haven't already done this, gone through what you have in front of you and begin thinking about inside of my music book, what are the things that we're going to be highly successful with on the woodwind front? Have you, I was talking to you about just muting out the, or, or turning off the video and listening to the audio. Have you just looked at the woodwind score? and asked yourself, can my woodwinds maximize everything that's written Mm -hmm. here, or is there a moment inside of there? So from the band director's perspective, from a judge's perspective, um, you're not gonna talk the whole time. I wouldn't think, right? No, and that's okay. That's okay. It's okay that there's moments where the woodwinds are not intended to be the feature of that one. But you do have to figure out the frequency of when they play and when they're brought back around to be presented. But there will be moments that there could be, you're just going to be pausing and evaluating. Maybe they have a lot of visual responsibilities. Maybe it's okay. It's a brass quartet that's in the front of the field when they do re-enter though you're prepared for them okay they did come back in and now all of a sudden their contribution is being evaluated Uh, another another area to think about and this this is the challenge for the performers the teachers the designers and the adjudicators at the state marching contest for the 5a and the 6a i think we all kind of get that we have woodwind soloists that are mic'd Mm. we we do have the wood woodwind throwdown moments where they're right there on the moment here's the one i really think is the challenge for all of us the full ensembles playing, or most of them, and we intentionally design some balance or creativity mm. and composition, we want you to hear the woodwinds on top of the ensemble. I love that opportunity, and I'm anxious to see which groups take advantage of that from an expressive standpoint. Uh, they bring the the louder brass and percussion instruments down to be able to hear that, and then the, the judge who can hear, like, okay, it's 2D, I'm not gonna be able to hear anyone. No, I'm gonna dig in really, really deeply to hear that from an adjudicator standpoint, and then I'm gonna really say, wow, Thank you for balancing the ensemble so I could hear that incredible flourish of technique along the way. Uh, this, this to me is just one of the new, the new chapters that's been open for Texas Marching Band. Well, imagine going to a concert and sight reading mm-hmm. if I couldn't right. hear your woodwinds. Right. Like right. imagine if I sat there through all of Elsa's procession mm-hmm. to the cathedral mm-hmm. and all I heard was brass the whole time. Right. That would be problematic for me. Um, I need to hear that woodwind color because it's so important. And certainly there will be moments inside of Elsa's procession that really do yeah. feature that voice, but then there are also those full 2D moments where the colors and the combinations therein um, really create something that's special and unique for your ensemble. And so I'm really hoping that as we as we expand this with woodwind and brass, and I want to say just like in the area boxes, the woodwind and the brass uh, boxes, they're identical. They are copy and paste yes, literally. of one another. There's nothing different on any of these. I want to show you for a second while we have some time here, um, just a little bit of, of what shows up on the back of the sheet because those questions, and I apologize for the word back over the front of it there, um, those questions can help you. It says, to what degree does the content written for the woodwinds demonstrate? Mm-hmm. And then it allows you to use, Mark was talking about the tick system earlier where you could almost go down to the bottom and give yourself some marks does it demonstrate effective utilization does it demonstrate suitable content and we could go down and on the achievement side does it demonstrate i'll do one of the last questions a purposeful approach to dynamic contrast Mm -hmm. so it gave us that opportunity inside of that to balance those two elements and come up with a score that that fits in addition on woodwind and brass percussion and really across these notice that the split is is a 50 50 split Mm -hmm. still a thousand points (coughs) <coughs> but we're thinking about that 50-50 split now, mm-hmm. as opposed to in the old boxes, it was 850 to 150. In the visual side, it was 700 to 300. Noticing now that the, the groups who have chosen to take on challenging content are going to see additional reward for that. Anything on that? Yeah, you know, another thing that I think is going to be great 
uh, just just branching these off into their own captions, thinking about the brass and the woodwinds. You can now take time to even delve into the the quality and the substance and the color and the, mm-hmm. and the resonance of these ensembles. Like you could actually sample. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the uh, the uh, saxophone color of sound that I hear. I'm gonna talk about the clarinet quality. Before it has to be a much uh, broader brushstroke mm-hmm. of like all the woodwinds are kind of playing this together. Now I can really delve into wow, listen to the baritones be able to play this. Now the mellophones are after this or the French horns. I can actually talk about quality. I can talk about substance in that one where before it was I have to give them this one sample. Now I can sample and I can talk about a lot of things and we I think we all value the quality uh, is, is precedent in, in uh, everything that we're doing with all these other descriptors. Yeah, yeah. And, and I want to say if you're not monitoring the chat online, I love the dialogue that, mm-hmm. that Mark started and, and then I saw Charlotte and, and Bob and James join in on that. Like this is a direction that we need to be going. Yes, Just like I feel like we maybe don't talk to our color guards enough. Um, mm-hmm. The opportunity to talk to woodwinds and, and to specifically to brass, um, I think are really important in terms of growing the pedagogy um, and to growing the quality of teaching. And I think we do great quality teaching in Texas yeah. already, but this allows us even a further level of evaluation. And I might offer you this. If you want to try an exercise with, for, for the band directors in the crowd, if you want to try this exercise, you know, you could take these questions, especially on the achievement side, mm-hmm. and you could hand them to your trumpet section leader and go hey after friday's show i want you to circle up with the trumpets on a scale of always consistently usually Mm -hmm. how was our tone quality on friday night Mm -hmm. how was our intonation on friday night how was our precision and timing how was our dynamic contrast and and there's a there's almost a student component i shared this with um i think uh, george (laughs) strickland had asked me a couple other folks had asked you know what's the student component of that the students can engage with these sheets even um, to begin having those inside of their section conversations which i think is really meaningful as well and it's helping create a lesson plan that they're they're now owners in the lesson plan they get we get what we're after we totally get what you're 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 harping on our quality of sound (laughs) that we're we're playing way past it each time yeah right and and i think it's it's good for kids to realize that so again when we think about this this seven judge system at state we we have uh, i'll just i'll number them not in priority order but judge one is ensemble judge two woodwind and judge three brass and we've talked a little bit about um what those are and again you're going to see today we're not going as deep into these sheets because as you can imagine these are a very small amount of people uh, on our webcast um and i I know that it's just those 5a and 6a judges but i did want to just kind of talk through a little bit of the philosophy there now when it comes to percussion as a woodwind player myself, as a brass player that Mark mm-hmm. is, um, we do not have the expertise at the level that you want to hear uh, when it comes to percussion. We know that. Uh, and so we had to bring in a guest uh, to do this one as well. Uh, we leaned on our dear friend, uh, DCI judging companion as well, Jeff Ostamore, uh, to talk with you. And I think Jeff is actually on one of the state panels to talk with you a little bit about the percussion sheet. Uh, so I'm going to let Jeff do, he's got uh, one clip and then we'll come back and look at the sheet together and then, and then we'll do his second clip. But uh, for the percussion directors out there, for the for the directors here, if you want to mark this timestamp in our discussion to say like, hey, my percussion guy, we, we need to watch this. Um, this is, Jeff has great insight as always and I think this is just brilliant. So here, go ahead and check this out. I will say right off the top of the, of the hour here that all of these subjects could really be extrapolated into a huge discussion, so I'm gonna to try to stay as concise as possible. So when you talk about the content, so everyone tends to think of vocabulary first, right? That's not wrong, but one of the things that I, I think that is really important that we are always shining a light on is what content truly can mean at the real expense of the aesthetic of the band, mm-hmm. right? So I'm gonna, con- continue to come back to what we can do as percussion directors to really elevate the wind book through the performers. And as a judge, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for opportunities to reward all the students on the field. Of course, through the lens of the designer and the director, so on and so forth. So when you talk about all these six or seven different bullet points in their content, each of them are a whole world. A lot of them could really be thought of initially as, oh, that's simply that's simply vocabulary. Well, that's just the, really the tip of the iceberg. So for instance, coordination of all performing elements, that right off the bat is simply anything that is percussive and how that really relates to the entire aesthetic of the show and the wind book. And so if you always look at the filter through which how is this enhancing the show through the percussive element, you will never go wrong, ever. So a lot of times, all of us, 
can be very myopic in terms of, oh, not enough flams, or there's a lot of diddles, or the front ensemble's doing this, and four mouths, ooh, permutations. All of that is good. All of that is very important. We're going to talk about those technical aspects, but the coordination of all performing elements could simply mean, what a beautiful way to use space. Did you notice that the bass drums did not come in in, t in the entire ballad? They used the upper battery as this color voice throughout all the woodwind passage, and they used a different implement. That was brilliant. I would have never thought of that. Well, that comes under the coordination of all performing elements, using space, using rests, using different implement changes and colors. So not just the coordination of what kind of musical vocabulary am I throwing down every 10 seconds of an eight minute show. Uh, moving on to the next bullet point, the suitability of musical content. I personally think that if you continue to come back to the word taste, what is going to enhance the composer or the arranger's intent? So if I'm playing Spark, I need to understand what the original source material was trying to pull and elicit from the listener. I hear this muted brass. I hear this color. Well, what is the percussion score going to do to actually jump off the page rather than, well, it's it's spark and it's beautiful, but here I am at a marching band show, so I'm gonna hear a snare drum tuned really high. That's not enough. We need to continue to ask ourselves, what can we do to elevate that in a different genre called marching band? Moving on to the next bullet point, the frequency and demand of movement while playing. So this is a really, really neat topic that is typically not articulated on a sheet. So kudos uh, to the, the folks there that put this on the sheet. So the frequency of movement would not just be the amount of steps you're taking while you're playing some challenging vocabulary, but also the type of movement, right? Mm -hmm. So now we have the indoor and the outdoor. All of those genres are really enhancing one another. So it's not just big step sizes or fast tempi that we're considering, but rather what am I doing from a responsibility standpoint to manipulate my upper body such that I have control of this soft roll while I'm doing this lower body responsibility. That is a, a whole world that we need to always keep at the tip of our brain because every band program is going to have a different level of comfort what they're gonna to introduce to their students. The next bullet point, content with respect to challenge. Now this is going to recapitulate the very first thing that I said, challenge. So as a percussionist, I like technique and chops and, and technical vocabulary as much as the next person. So the first thing that many of us are drawn to when they see the word challenge is, boy, that such and such band has a lot of fast rolls, or boy, the permutation, the front ensemble, or there's a, there's a quick 30 second note lick here at Flight of the Bumblebee. All those things are obviously challenging to the ear, but there are all kinds of other challenges that I think that a lot of us overlook. For instance, space. If you have something that is not quite as challenging to play once your hands are engaged, but you're waiting three quarter notes before you come in, as we all know, veteran band directors, we all know that teaching students to negotiate space is easily the hardest skill in developing that innate sense of maturity and space to wait and place a musical moment exactly where it's intended to be. To me, that's just as great of a challenge, and that's on top of all the technical vocabulary. Uh, the other types of challenges would, of course, be environmental. What are we doing in terms of our body movement, our frequency of body movement, our step size? Where are we on the field? Is the battery in front of the winds? And that's and we actually saw a very, very high achieving marching band that went very, very high in the process the last go around that actually had two moments in their show and they did it beautifully. They did it from a balance and a touch perspective and put the winds behind them and the timing was excellent. Well, that takes a lot of coordination. And again, recognizing that as a challenge is not just what the, the, the battery played, but rather everything that encompassed that vocabulary. Continuity. Awesome. I'm going to I'm going to jump out of Jeff's, but he has right. such great information to share. I was telling Mark, I think what I'm going to do with Jeff's interview, because I think it's really important for our percussion directors. I know that at the state level, there are only four percussion judges and they are all dynamite individuals level, yeah. Yeah, who are going to be just fine with it. But uh, but I think what I'm going to do is share it more for the percussion directors to hear Jeff's whole. It's about an hour long interview he and I had um, just talking about the percussion sheets. And so uh, I do want to go back and share them, but I wanted to make sure our judges had an understanding at, at all levels um, as 
we're talking about area percussion inside of that smaller box, transitioning to state percussion, you know, what's being asked. And it's things like the coordination of all performing elements. You're like, oh, Jerry, I've seen all of these. I just heard Jeff talking about them. But notice that the right side's a little bit different and that it splits battery and front ensemble, right? And so that gives you an opportunity to talk about quality and tuning in terms of the battery and the front ensemble, to talk about technique, because some programs may have different strengths and weaknesses, yeah. and we want to ensure that both the content conversation is there, but also that the line between the battery and the front ensemble is, is also discussed. This is also the first instance we'll have one of our judges that will be on the field. And the percussion judge, now before you freak out about it, uh, <clears throat> they've been asked to sample from the front sideline. And the furthest the percussion judge can go is, there, there's the graphic you can see, up to six feet onto the field. So they're not going to be running around in the middle of your formation, so you don't need to worry about that. But you've, if you've attended maybe some other uh, contests where there are field judges, we do know that's a certain dynamic. But the uh, individual visual judge and, of course, the percussion judge, you're going to now see them down there. We felt that was the best way for them to evaluate. Uh, for them being at the top, it's not a true sampling of what they can evaluate up close and personal with technique, balance, then, of course, getting down to the nitty-gritty when they, the battery percussion make their way to the middle of the field and, and beyond. Yeah, yeah, and so I, I gave you the graphic there. I zoomed out for you just so you could see that a little bit better. But you can see that percussion judge can float around where the front ensemble mm -hmm. is and then can actually get, um, you know, I, I think generally we don't want them too far into the field, but we understand they may need to advance a little bit. We, As Mark said, they're not going to be in the forms or anything. Right. Um, but that you will have a couple of field, the next one's coming up when we talk about visual here in a second, but a couple of field level adjudicators who are going to be watching um, at that. You know, one of the, and, and I think it's a good time to say that. When you think about region, right? So at mm -hmm. region, you judge um, music and you judge visual and you judge content. And Everything. then you get to area and we kind of zoomed in a little tighter. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting to state and look at, at 5A, 6A, look at how tightly zoomed in mm -hmm. we're asking these judges to be. I mean, now you are like really into the thick of it. But I think that that's where we need our judges to be because discerning who's at the very top of their game this far yeah. down, I mean, I, I, I think you need to, to have that flexibility. And so um, I want to go back to, to Jeff. He's going to talk a little bit more. So he was really addressing a lot on the content side. Mm -hmm. Let's talk. Let's hear him talk a little bit about the achievement side of things um, and just kind of what he's looking for uh, from an adjudication perspective on achievement. I think that there's a world of opportunity in each one of these, but one of the things that I think is very, very important for directors to understand that uh, a very, very educated judge will not assume, and we need to be really held accountable on the adjudicator side, is to not assume that quality is universal. Mm. There is characteristic sound, and that is universal. There is resonance, there is control, there is expression. But quality, in my mind, and how I like to explain this when I'm chatting with folks in different uh, situations, is that quality really is a function of the genre of music and what you're trying to say. So I like to use, and I'll just nerd out for a moment here with all my percussion friends, if I'm going to play a role and I really dig in and I want every 30 second note to be very, very strong, that might be incredibly important when I hit an impact and the band is playing Bartok. That same really machine gun type sound may not be appropriate if I'm playing a lyrical counter phrase in mm -hmm. Debussy. So quality would not necessarily match there. Now, the rhythmic consistency of those two examples, of course, that's universal. But quality, we need to be careful how we throw that around. Quality, and this is the most important thing I can share, has to do with making characteristic sounds that are come from a very mature aspect. So if they are really, really after supporting the most sincere part of that musical moment and they're making great sounds that is quality mm -hmm. that is quality quality does not come from my school of where i went to this drum corps my school of music that i graduated from because that tends to be a little bit of a, a delineation in, in our world so i just want to make sure that everyone knows that in the truest sense quality has to do with the characteristic sound that is extrapolated from the right musical moment so that being said, tuning, 
that really goes hand in hand with characteristic sounds. Obviously, you want the the drum uh, or the or the, the the membranophone, if you will, to always have as much resonance or as much articulation is a pro that is appropriate for that musical moment. So again, they work hand in hand. A lot of it is just being. Uh, on top of how much diligence you need to put into the quads, for instance, I, I'm unfortunately I'm 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 sad to say that it's it's very common for a lot of marching bands not to put in the time to make sure that all those drums are in tune with themselves. It does take time. It does take time, but not unlike I need to tune my high woodwinds before every contest. It is no different. Without proper intonation, it just students will sound less mature, and that's that's not the part that's not the fault of the student. So we need to take the time to really do that for the bass drums, the quads, and of course the snare drums. Uh, precision and timing, uh, we could go through all these. I hope I I, I don't uh, belabor these points, but uh, precision and timing, uh, we're going to talk about. That's a universal quality there in the front ensemble as well. That is literally just what it sounds like, and making sure that how they are being asked to to play a two D rhythm that perhaps lines up with another part of the percussion section or the winds, and just evaluating are they doing that together? Right? It's just excellence. Uh, technique. This is a, this is a really really hot hot topic here, very much like quality, and it's very important that we take a look at the end goal of technique and not how they are physiologically getting the sound to come out of the drum. Now, case in point, I am an, a, an adjudicator and I'm watching a group. In the back of my mind, I teach my own groups or I've taught my own groups for many years, maybe very, very successfully. And I look at this marching band and I say to myself, that's not how I would have had the students play their instrument. In a really, really highly held accountable adjudicator, they will say, that is not my call. The technique has to do with creating the appropriate sounds. Mm -hmm. And that's something I just want to continue to say everywhere I go. Technique is only a function of achieving the best characteristic sound. That's why all of these work hand in glove from a really, really big picture adjudicator. So technique, as long as they are consistent by which they are getting the correct sound, and we're going to come to balance and blend, so on and so forth, that's how you evaluate technique. Again, just to put a really fine point on this, not to say that is not the technique that I taught in my career, therefore technique is poor. That is absolutely incorrect. And I want all the directors to know that a really excellent adjudicator does not think that way, and I want you to be completely confident to teach whatever technique is going to serve the musical moment and more importantly creates that incredible characteristic sound. Mm -hmm. Blend balance and transparency. I like to to use these bullet points from the context of the Chrono String Quartet mm -hmm. or the Dallas Wind Symphony. It could be any musical ensemble in the world and if you're listening on that level of true match and inflection and then you have that in your mind and your ear and then you look at this subsection of the marching band drum line then of course you can you can apply the same principles so blend balance and transparency transparency starts to speak to something else but in terms of blend and balance in particular are we creating the right sounds from the right intensity level. And here's something that a lot of people don't understand. The smaller the, the number of students in a section, the more difficult that is mm -hmm. to, to really uh, adjudicate and also to teach. So when you have a nine man snare line, there's some things you can kind of get away with, but there are three, you can hear those students, especially like you mentioned, if the percussion judge is out on the field, you can definitely hear at the top of a roll, this player tends to, to accent a little bit more, so on and so forth. So that blend, throughout every phrase and the balance from performer to performer is tremendously important. Uh, phrasing and artistic expression. This is just taking the written page and are the students making it their own? Are they reading what's been given to, the, given to them and are they playing it relatively well but it doesn't move you or are they taking control of where are the small and the longer phrases going? So a lot of these small bullet points tend to work off of the, the content. Mm -hmm. Well, my instructor didn't give me a long phrase. So that's why this has to be a hand in glove achievement. That's why it's on the same sheet. 
right? But at the same time, if I've given you X, are you, as the student, are you turning it into Y? Mm -hmm. Does it have a sincere amount of shape? So that's, that's what that's all about. And then dynamic contrast, again, similar to that, you just have to dial into the fact that at the end of the day, it has to be worth listening to. Mm -hmm. But the arranger didn't, we don't know, we don't care, and we can't see it in the stands. Mm -hmm. Does it move us at the end of the day? If I'm listening to this high school band's clarinet section in this part of the show, I want to be moved. I want to notice that there's care and intonation and quality of sound, just like this phrase of the quads in this band's opener. Mm -hmm. It is no different. It has to have some sort of musical shape, and it has to be full of characteristic sound. The brilliant Jeff Ostamore. Yes. <laughs> I, it's, I'm telling you, and I, I forget who posted it here. I think Mr. Warasello said it, it, it is really good information. Um, and, and I'll try. I was telling Mark, I guess I have to go back to the editing wood shop. It'll work for you now. <laughs> <laughs> to, to build these out. Um, you know, there, there are hours of interview and, and just really great ideas from all these folks. So, uh, But I'll definitely, for team percussion, I'll get Jeff's done first. Uh, and I'll make that out because I, I think he had some great points that, that just all of us need to be, be conscious of and thinking about. Well, we're going to dive into visual now. So that kind of, you know, on the state front, we have four music sheets. We have the ensemble, woodwind, brass, and percussion. We just talked about those. We have two visual sheets and a content and design sheet left mm -hmm. to talk about here. And we've got a little less than an hour and we'll be right on time or maybe a little early even it looks like. And so... I want to talk about the visual sheet. The visual is div divided into two sheets. Uh, one is the other downstairs judge. That's the visual individual judge. And then there's a visual ensemble judge upstairs. So let me, I'm going to maybe list some of the descriptors and Mark, I'll let you kind of reflect on these. On the visual individual, we talk about effective re visual reinforcement of the music, suitability, frequency and demand, simultaneous responsibility, continuity and flow, coordination and staging. And then on that achievement side, things like control of form, body, equipment, um, timing, uh, a demonstration of individual style, recovery. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking as an adjudicator on the downstairs, mm -hmm. what, what kind of things are they hearing from you? Sure. In, individually, it, it is intimidating for all of us that maybe have come out of the school thought of being a musician. We maybe don't know all the dance terms. Maybe mm -hmm. we don't know all the contemporary terms. We do recognize uh, foot placement, direction changes, we, we, the things that we've always done uh, as performers and what we've been teaching for several years. Uh, it, it, it's important that we recognize uh, that things look similar. So you're sampling small groups of people. You're seeing if the, the technique is the same. You're able to either ask questions. Is this the way you want this to look? Or is this the area where, like, wow, I really understand this. I do have a question about where their hand placement is. Do you want mm -hmm. their free hand moving around side to side? Yet I see some people are not doing that. So you're really trying to bring up uh, points of nuances along the way. I do love in the performance in this, you, you're obviously the color guard, has huge contributions in this area. We want to recognize their talents. Uh, again, the, the uh, judges on the field, they can only sample up to six feet on the field. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's hard to kind of maybe tell a flag group that's in the back, but we can tell the uh, the rifles with the presenter. Maybe there's a group of dancers or a group with a prop, and we, we, we bring those front and center, and we definitely need to give them our attention. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's an opportunity to talk about training, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that for a school can be, when we talk about growing the activity, yeah. as an adjudicator, when I can talk to you about training and how well your students are doing X, Y, and Z, forward march, backwards march, how they're handling, uh, you know, their shoulders when they're marching at 90 yeah. degrees to the front. <clears throat> I think those are so key to helping grow those programs at the state level mm -hmm. and ensure that when they're back two years later that, you know, stronger and, and better than ever. Mm -hmm. And so this individual visual judge um, has some, some great responsibilities. We're going to talk about the ensemble thing and then we're going to turn it over to a couple of, uh, of clips here. Let's, let's just look at the, we won't go quite as in detail because you'll see it's very similar on the individual or on the ensemble content, excuse me. We talk again about effective use. We see that quite a lot. Um, we see things like visual reinforcement of the music, um, does effective use of equipment, movement, again, we're thinking about our color guard friends mm -hmm. there, suitability, frequency and demand, continuity, you're like, this sounds very similar, and it is, but now, instead of looking at the individual performers, you're looking more at that global uh, sense, and you're looking at the achievement of form and interval precision and timing, uniformity of style, professionalism and recovery. So, uh, again, I think very similar, but you're looking at it rather than through the micro, you're, right. you're seeing the macro. We're of a telescope. 
the uh, if you think about it, if this was a music music sheet, we would we would all understand it. It's the exact same elements in place. Uh, think of the parallels that are drawn between a music ensemble sheet and a visual ensemble sheet. Hmm. It's coordination. It's precision. It's balance. It's all the exact same things, but in a more visual way. Uh, it has a marching component. It has some contemporary movement. Uh, it has uh, contagions that happen. It has where do we want to be focused visually, uh, and then the individual exact same way. How do those woodwind players sound up close and personal? And then how does this individual group of woodwind players move individually? And you're sampling things from, like you said, from the close up and also blowing the picture back. Yeah. So let's go to a clip. Uh, we're going to head down to Claudia Taylor Johnson <clears throat> High School, the reigning 6A state champion. Uh, this is Jarrett Lipman and Jody Rhodes. They're going to talk a little bit about the visual sheet. I want to begin by apologizing. There are a little bit of errant GSM sounds, those little mobile phone you're going to hear inside of there. Mm -hmm. Disregard those. We know what's going on, but uh, you'll be able to hear all of Jarrett and Jody's commentary without any trouble. So let's, uh, let's check out what they had to share with us. Um, I think as we were talking through the visual individual and visual ensemble sheets, the most important thing is to remember that simultaneous responsibility, number one, is marching and playing your horn. Uh, what we'll talk about today is a rubric that helps us judge that consistently from adjudicator to adjudicator. So when it comes to looking at the individual sheets, I think we always look at it as the what and the how, you know, what the performer has been given and how they achieve it. Uh, and the goal in creating these new sheets was that the performers had an opportunity to demonstrate all of their training, their fundamental skills, uh, and really that if, if there was an opportunity to acknowledge the color guard and the training that they had been doing on the field and, and their equipment, uh, and if there was choreography, and uh, just giving a, a rubric and a template really so that everything on the field could be looked at as a total picture. So the individual visual sheet, um, a lot of times whether it's it's the drill and the speed of the drill or the technique, uh, how do we reinforce, uh, you know, from the visual standpoint what's going on in the music? And I think that that, um, that could be everything from choreography to uh, the marching technique and the style for the moment. Uh, it could also be the movement for the color guard, so it really leaves that open-ended. Um, and then the suitability of the visual content uh, is very similar to what was on the old sheets, uh, where it was, is this appropriate? for the level of the band and I think that sometimes um when we look at, at ensembles, the, de the demand may be uh, above the head of the performers or sometimes uh, the performers could be challenged to another level. So there's always you know, making that decision with that. Um, what do you think a little bit, you talked about the, the frequency of demand with movement and simultaneous responsibilities, but how do you feel about that? Well, I think with uh, simultaneous responsibility, the first one is marching and playing your instrument. After that, anything that you add to enhance the show or reinforce the show has to be appropriate for the age level, the ability level, and the musical content. And so a lot of groups that make it to state are already doing these things, and this just helps guide the process of really how to score it. But I would just say, uh, when it comes to appropriate vocabulary for visual individual, um, you're being judged on how kids do things the same especially in this caption because, um, is it still on the field? Is this one gonna be on the field? Yeah, so it's close up, live, and personal. And so they really get a good read of what's happening across the field, how you've trained your students, like Jarrett said, and then um, it does it match the style of music. So I think, you know, if you're doing, you know, a slow piece, you don't wanna see harsh, angular, forced arch movement and vice versa, if you're doing a fast piece, you don't want to see ballet, st or maybe you do, you know, it's up to interpretation. And then um, for me, the biggest thing on here as we go through this, the frequency of demand, I don't, I just want to make sure simultaneous responsibility does not mean how often you do choreography. Um, it's whatever is appropriate for your group, and you're getting judged on the appropriateness that you bring with your skill set. So it is what it is that year. And then we have a rubric that says it's usually consistently and always. I'm going to assume that if we're at state, we're pretty much in the consistent and always level anyway. And um, to, just to continue with the flow and the pacing of the show as it relates to the visual. So I, it's pretty self-explanatory. I just think don't do things that are inappropriate for, just because you see the Blue Devils do it doesn't mean a 14-year-old child on the field 
can pull that off. So. Well, I think for me, the best part about these sheets, uh, and especially looking at the, the individual visual, is, is it really evaluates what each program does well. Uh, it's it's an opportunity to showcase the technique. It's an opportunity to showcase the teaching uh, and really what the students have been given. And so uh, it, it really isn't about props. It's not so much about the design of the show um, as it is about the fundamental instruction of the individual. So looking at how well they do what they've been given. Uh, and really, a lot of times we, we evaluate how well they do it by looking at what they've been given. And so the content side, um, as you put your shows together, I, I, I don't know that this is really about changing anything that we've done. Um, I think that it's, it's about uh, giving tools to be able to acknowledge and recognize all of the performers on the field. I feel great about the fact that the terminology, um, we've got form and body and equipment, uh, which, which is more inclusive uh, for Color Guard and for our dance teams that are a part of it. And, and really, uh, the emphasis is, is always on achievement and, and how well you do whatever it is that we've been given. So when comparing groups at the highest level, uh, at, the, at the bottom there is the continuity and flow pacing and there is coordination and staging. And I think when we get into those, those decisions of having to decide band A or band B, um, it, credit can be given uh, if there is that, that, uh, that inherent design. We've built something into the show that is really creative or really unique from a staging standpoint and, and that will help us be able to separate groups and, and delineate uh, a, a top group that always has those creative staging moments from a, from a next group down that usually has great staging moments. Uh, it makes a difference. Yep. Uh, the other thing about the individual is I just want to go back and talk to the training a little bit too because to me, when you're that close down on the field, I think it's one of the, the most fun captions to judge because you're interacting with the kids. Every kid is there to do their very best. And it's just like you said, you actually get to award those who are achieving at a very high level. It, it, even if you look at the box, the way that it's color coded, there's like a middle portion of where most bands would fit in that box. And then those that do come in and they have, you know, a well-trained, a well-oiled machine coming in there. And it's not, it to me always is not just what they do, it's how they do it. And so communication I think is really important too when you're on the field. You can get that sense of connectivity with the kids. Um, you can see if they're, if they're you know communicating with the audience you can see if they've bought in to what that motion or movement means at that particular point of the show um, and the development of the show you can read all of that down on the field and you get a really good sense of the emotional quality of the show too down on the field too from the individual performer which is i love Awesome. I'll, I'll jump right out of that one as Jody finishes up there. Um, I, I like their conversation just regarding content. And I, I so appreciate that she said, just because we're seeing the Blue Devils do it, just because we're seeing doesn't right. mean a 14 year old child needs to do it. You need to maximize a, a, the content that fits the group. And so I think as an adjudicator, our role is to ask, is that content being maximized? Are those performers challenged by what's been sure. given to them? Um, and you know it, that's going to be evidenced through their achievement of it. I, I hope uh, we, we are evaluating them. The educators have, have planned this out. Let's start with this maybe plan. Did we did we get a chance for them to be successful? Okay, this is above their heads. Let's pare it back, or let's add to it. Hey, they're achieving this. Let's add something else that mm -hmm. can go on. Of course, none of it should be where it's surpassing musically. We want that to be where that that is still the primary focus. But the visual enhance, enhancement and reinforcement just keeps bringing that movie together, like we talked about earlier. Yeah, yeah. So I went on. I have one more clip for you to share with with Jared and with Jody. We went on to talk with them a little bit about the achievement side, on an individual and an ensemble, you know, piece from the visual. What does is, what is quality achievement look like from an adjudicator's perspective? Again, I want to apologize. There are the little GSM sounds, and this was the first video that Mark and I shot we of learned, this project. We, learned a lot, yeah. we were not great yet. <laughs> we got better. Uh, there is a spot at the very end where the screen goes black. The audio continues just fine. So don't worry. You just listen to Jody's voice, uh, but it's about eight seconds of a blank screen for a second. You know, live and learn. It's, we're all in the process together. So it's been an adventure. Here we go. 
I think the visual ensemble sheet is pretty exciting. Uh, I, I love the fact that we've, we've not moved away from ranks and files. I think ranks and files were famous in Texas for that. So as we look at acknowledging and, and, and giving credit to what bands do, um, the ensemble sheet now opens the door, I think, to acknowledge the importance of every performer that's on the field. So if it's a dancer, if it's a color guard member, if it's a woodwind player, a brass player, percussion, um, and it looks at the total package uh, from a design standpoint of how all these performers are utilized and then how well they do what they do. So as you're putting your shows together, again, is it really any different than what we've necessarily been doing? In some ways, only because we're looking closer at the involvement of all of the performers and the opportunities that the show design gives them. So, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a step in the right direction without giving up some of the great things because, because Texas bands are known for the quality of their performances. They're known for the clarity and the cleanliness of, of the drill uh, and making sure that that's always going to be the top priority. And the visual ensemble sheet as it is now allows for that to happen while maybe encouraging us to take some steps in in directions to see what else might be possible. Yeah, I think in general in Texas, the strength has always been music and marching and the visual ensemble kind of opens the door to be able to create more uh, on the field for your kids as long as the staging is appropriate, just looking at it from an adjudicator standpoint. Uh, now that we're looking at all of the uh, different elements on the field and how they work together is the are the flags moving up and down together are we making the pictures are we hitting the forms is it staged well um, are you looking where you're supposed to be looking at that moment has the drill brought our focus there all of those things can now be rewarded with this sheet um, including our traditional forms intervals mm -hmm. spacing alignment covering down all of the things that we've always done for a long time. So uh, to me, the visual ensemble is exciting and it's different from the individual because in uh, up top for the visual ensemble, you can, uh, if, we'll take the word professionalism. For me, visual ensemble too is, at least when I judge, I very much know how a band is going to perform by how they come onto the field. And so if, it, if, they, if they display that professionalism in everything that they do, how they get on the field, how they lay out the props, how they set out the flags, and then how they go to their opening set, then you know that that professionalism is probably going to carry all the way through the show. So I think that's important too. The setup for the performances is watched as well. So I, I think all of that goes into the sheet. And the, you know, we talk about the coordinating and the staging aspect of this. I, I think that kind of runs through every sheet now that we have on the, the state uh, adjudication. It's, you know, coordination of all the elements. Do you see what you hear? Do you hear what you see? Is there a primary focus? Is there a secondary focus? And are all of those elements being achieved at what, what consistently or always or usually and so I to me that's what's exciting about visual ensemble it dives just a little bit deeper than how a kid marches and plays their horn but um, because it is a coordination of all the elements on the field and so it really tends to lend itself to to recognize color guard color guard equipment dance um, choreography whatever you want to put out there for your show and I think, for me, looking at, at the bigger picture of everything, the, the ensemble sheet is going to be the macro, and the individual is going to be the micro. You know, we're, we're Lady Bird Johnson High School, so we always talk about the wildflowers, and you think about the single blue bonnet uh, and, and how beautiful that can be, but also looking at the field of blue bonnets uh, and what it makes when all of them come together. Uh, a lot of times, the ensemble can simply be how clean the drill is, how well the performers cover down and create the box and rotate the box, how well the flags move in time together, uh, and, and it's the total sum of its parts. So whereas the visual sheet has been uh, split currently in its form uh, into those areas, now we've got a separate judge, one that focuses on that ensemble caption, and then there's the, the, the field judge down there. And I think it's exciting to have the individual judge down on the field, because while you can judge individuals from the box, it's definitely more impactful to be able to pick up on the passion of the performer and the training of the performer and really look at the details of the uniformity with everything from the field level. Yeah. So we look at, 
you know, being up at the top, in, you know, up top of the Alamo Dome versus down on the field, you really can, can get a good feel for the differences in what we're going to see. Yeah, the nuts and bolts of how we train the kids and then the beauty of how it translates to the audience are, are what, to me, the two sheets are about. So. Awesome. Well, thank you for being patient through our, our black screen again. That was the first one we recorded, so we did our best on, along the way. But I thought great information, uh, yeah. you know, through and through in everything that they shared. I did want to add to, to one thing Jody shared, because I know this is sometimes a bit of a, and I thought she said it really well, uh, but it can sometimes be a bit of a, of a sticking point. At, at UIL, we don't start judging uh, until the time starts. And she was talking about you can tell that level of professionalism. And I do agree with her. I think when we talk about impression analysis comparison, that impression does begin when the group walks into the Alamo Dome. Sure. You know, you can tell that they're poised, that they're put together, but we don't officially start judging. That can certainly aid in your impression, but we're not beginning that analysis. We're not allowing that to impact the score. Um, but she's not wrong. The, 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 the tell of those groups coming in, you see that professionalism walking in, and you know what you're about to see. It, it should make you excited as an adjudicator. Okay, this is going to be real special. I'm getting everything prepared. I'm not making my, my official opinion yet. But when, of course, the clock starts at 7.59, we're, we're on. Right, yeah, yeah. right. So we're going to finish out today's training talking about the content and design sheet, probably the most long-awaited sheet, and, and I, I want to just kind of dive in, but we have some great panel discussion uh, videos here that uh, Mark shared a panel back again at Claudia Taylor Johnson High School. Uh, we had Ronnie Rios on the panel, Jody Rhodes, uh, and Dan Morrison joined us, uh, and so this will give you a chance to talk about that. But before we do that, let's just talk through the sheet so you know what's on it. On the left side, you, th you see things like effective use of all performing elements. You're like, oh, I've seen that before, and effective visual reinforcement of the music, suitability, frequency and demand of movement, simultaneous responsibility, content with respect to challenge, continuity and flow, coordination and staging. Up until this point, everything there has been on an area sheet, has a lot of that's been on a region sheet. I mean, that, that's old content for us. That's old, that's old information. But here are the couple of newer ones, creativity, originality and imagination. Uh, and then variety and range of expression. Again, we're trying to, at the 5A, 6A level, mm -hmm. differentiate the, the, the very you know, top of the top groups uh, is what we're now looking I, at. I love this sheet. I love that we have, uh, in Texas have finally arrived at this point. I'm, I'm looking forward to all the creative people we have in this state. From uh, They've put shows together, designers and instructors and band directors, uh, what they're going to be able to present this fall. Um, no pressure when you judge this sheet. You're, you are considered to be the most educated person in the audience. So for a few people that are doing it, I know you are, and we're really proud of you, but that's the, that's the mantra. Of you need to come in and have a good understanding of, uh, if they present a style of music, you have some basis of knowledge. Uh, you understand color palettes. You understand this is a certain mood. I need to see this visual mood there. And then, of course, the other part of it is you're, you're recognizing innovation, originality. Uh, wow, what an expressive quality. There are effects that are happening, mm -hmm. and you, uh, you have to receive it like you're an audience member. I, I know when I was learning from my mentors, I was really in kind of the analysis mode. Mm -hmm. I was kind of like, I want to really kind of nit nitpick it and kind of dissect it. And I really had to just sit back and just enjoy it, get my popcorn and kind of go, give me an emotion, give me something to get excited about, give me something to be surprised about. And uh, in that we want it to be where the educated folks in the audience are also getting the, the thought process from a, a theme that's being presented. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to pause at the end of the, the content conversation to show you a short video where they're talking about specifically that. Again, this is uh, uh, Mark's chairing this panel. Uh, Jody Rhodes is on it. Ronnie Rios joined us and Dan Morrison. Uh, and let's hear a little bit about content and design. Okay. One of the things that I really want to see is audio visual coordinations, mm -hmm. because as an adjudicator, this will show me and tell me that there was real conversations and planning and decisions that were made to put the production together. It's not just like, you know, maybe in the years past uh, or the early years of marching band, you know, where one guy did the music, one guy did the drill, one person did the color guard, and everybody just sent in their separate stuff to the director. And then the directors of, of that team just started to teach uh, the, the show. Mm. But those conversations and those plans really didn't come together. I'll give you an example. You get to the big musical, maybe there's a big, uh, you're in ballad, and you get to the big moment in ballad. It's the big hit, everybody's coming in, and boom, here comes the goosebump moment, and there's a strong, uh, you know, melodic idea, and there's a strong uh, music phrase being performed by the entire uh, group, 
you know, percussion, horn line, uh, front ensemble, electronics, and there's a strong visual statement that supports that. Maybe the color guard, there's a strong visual statement from the color guard. This color, this new color that just got brought out during the hit of the ballad that we hadn't seen before. Maybe a double flag, maybe somebody on props now. Uh, maybe the props are spinning. Maybe there's some body choreo to go with that. So there's some strong supporting uh, visual reinforcement of that strong music phrase. So that shows me and tells me that there's some audiovisual coordinated moments in the production. That's what I'm looking for. And the one other thing I wanted to add was when it comes to the demand is I would like to see, you know, the physical demands that the students bring, the music demands they bring, maybe some of the environments where they're spread out and whatnot. How many students are involved in those types of demands uh, is, you know, it can't just be your all state section or the best section in the group. It's gotta be the entire ensemble and the frequency of those demands. How many times does the ensemble have magic moments like that where their demands are high? So that from, you know, from, those are things that I look for as an adju adjudicator on this sheet. The, some of the things that I would, you know, w would like to, to have out there as I'm in the box upstairs. That's great. Dan or Jody, any comments on Go ahead. You got any? Yeah. All right. uh, <laughs> for me, uh, content and design is just a really simple concept. It's It still goes into simultaneous responsibility. The number one simultaneous responsibility is how you march and play your horn. And then is there just a coordination of ideas overall through the through the piece, as, as Ronnie has described? And um, to me, it's as simple as... Uh, hearing what you see and seeing what you hear. Mm -hmm. And then again, kind of like we talked in the visual ensemble sheets too, is there a priority for a primary focus on the field? Is it staged uh, appropriately? Is it, uh, do we put kids in a place to achieve success? Um, is the demand appropriate? I think this sheet really just ties in the music and visual concepts into one ni nice, neat package. Mm -hmm. And so when I judge that, is there a variety of elements? Are we starting with um, different styles of music? If we're playing different styles of music, are we playing them the right style? Um, you know, if, do we have those musical nuances? All of that can be, can be covered in this sheet. So it really, to me, this sheet just is, it, again, it leads to the objectivity of judging. It helps focus in the judge on numbers and um, boxes and again like we talked about earlier usually if you're at the state level you're in the consistently box right. already which is the bigger box on the field and then you strive for always so uh we talked earlier about taking risk if you do take a little bit of a risk this is where that could pay off for you or not pay off for mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. um but to me, it's just, it's still about marching and playing. It's did you get the kids in the right place? Did you get the soloist in the right place? Did you use the color guard to help bring focus? Does the color guard take a moment? Um, any of those things that encapsulate content and design. Is it the appropriate choice of music for the show? You know, if, mm -hmm. if, is it the appropriate colors for the show? <clears throat> the show's Rhapsody in Blue and you use... Um, not blue. <laughs> Not blue. Tangerine and chartreuse, maybe we have a problem. Or maybe we don't. Maybe you can sell right. it that way. It's an ironic. So, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if we do, you know, a show that is taken from a ballet, you know, how are you going to treat it? Are you going to treat it as such? Is the movement going to depict that? Are you going to be able to create the imagery to connect that story to the mm -hmm. audience um, where the audience can understand you know, if it's a highbrow type show, if it's artsy, mm -hmm. are you going to feel something when you see it? If it's more literal, are you going to see, you know, mm -hmm. that depiction on the field? So, you know, I, people will often say that judges are just a little bit more maybe educated audience members, and I, I very much subscribe to that. And so I think so much of this is about, you know, audience engagement and then leading on from there is judge engagement. And I think that um, these words and descriptors and what's talked about here just gives concrete ways to talk about how to engage the audience. If you have variety, you're going to have more engagement. If mm -hmm. your pacing is appropriate, people are going to want to pay attention more. Um, you know, if you have excellence happening at the highest level, that's the ultimate engager, and right? And, and I mean, I moved to Texas because bands have excellence at the highest mm -hmm. level, and that is that makes the audience want to pay attention. 
attention, you know? And I think that's really important. Um, and I, so I think that this just helps ensure that if you're looking at this when you're designing your, your marching band show, that you're putting things into it that are gonna make the audience be engaged. And in the end, that's the most rewarding thing for everybody. That's by far the most rewarding thing for students when they perform a show that they can tell the audience felt really good about when they walk off the field and, and throughout the show. That goes beyond any type of trophy or anything you could ever get. And this sheet gives directors and designers sort of a vehicle to help them ensure that they're doing that for their students. Um, and that can look so different for so many different groups. And, and I know I mentioned this when we were talking about the brass and woodwind sheets, mm -hmm. but, but um, this helps judges be able to compare groups that might be very different because different isn't a bad thing. We, we want to get a lot of variety. We want to see a lot of groups come out with their own identities. You know, like the Reagan band and the Johnson band have very different identities, but both successful, though. Yeah, thank really. you for not making me say that. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it. Appreciate I'm a fan that. of both of them. I, thank you, yeah. And, but so, you know, it, it, for a judge that might, uh, could be, well, how do I compare these groups? But, well, now you have these things to look at. Do both groups, am I engaged? Is the pacing appropriate? Do they have a variety of effects? Are, uh, are the students carrying the, the artistic you know, intent of the show throughout the show. You can do that through any vehicle and any design of a show, and I think that's amazing. And I think this just makes it so that's even more appropriate to lean into your strengths and do what you feel good about doing. Um, but at the end of the day, for me, uh, what we do is all about audience engagement in concert band and in marching band, and judges are in the audience and they want to enjoy the show um, and they also want to see excellence at the, high level, at the highest level. And to me, those two things go hand in hand. To, uh kind of piggyback on what you guys were talking about, you know, thinking about this in a very accessible way. Uh, the, the movies that resonate with all of us, believe it or not, all have these things. Mm -hmm. It's well paced, it's well acted. We've set them up, it's the scenery, it's the payoff of the soundtrack, which we all kind of are probably attracted towards if they really kind of had that moment. And that's really what we're doing. We're creating this coordinated moment, visually, musically, um, how it's edited. You know, there's, there's great things that are left on the editing room floor mm -hmm. that don't make it to the field, but we have to make that choice as the quote producer. And it's that accessibility where that resonates with our audiences and with us, and then we're trying to do that on a much different kind of scale, but at least it has the exact same talking points. And that was you know, what Ronnie was talking talking about earlier, I think. And then, uh, Jody, a couple things you were talking about along the way with, about, uh, we see what we hear and we, we hear what we see. I, I think what it does for the state of Texas is it gives value to everyone on the field. Yep. Every person on the field now has value in what is contributed out there. It's the color guard member that that really is contributing something there with like, wow, they're really contributing to the design of the show and how well it's done. It's the, the student running electronics. It's the student on the field. Of course, it's the soloist. It's every woodwind player on the field. And I love that now where it's not the weight is on a brass player's shoulder the whole, whole show or something. But now everyone on the field is contributing to something which we always want to value. Now it actually gives them some points assessments and some things where we can identify and say, look, we've all did this together in a true sense here. Yeah, great points all around from that panel. And just talking about this new sheet, I know like for some, this sheet's a little scary. Um, it just seems like it's, we're, are we looking at just the, the, the content, who wrote the show, who designed the drill? But what, what I want to kind of flip our conversation on as we get into this next discussion with this panel is what is the achievement of this content and design look like. And so uh, we have some descriptors like delivered and sustained roles. We have things like artistry and nuance. Yes, musicians, we know what nuance is and, and we know nuance. I mean, I think about, you know, judging, judging honor band, right? Mm -hmm. Like we just hear those groups that exude nuance inside, just every detail has been sewn up and, right. and thought through um, and, and, and involvement. You know, that every performer, I think uh, Matthew alluded to that earlier when he was talking with, with Joni Perez about their New York show at the Woodlands, where just like every little involvement piece, they're dressed as sailors and it has to look just like this, um, is taken care of. Because again, we're talking about 5A, 6A. We're talking about, you know, at the state marching contest, deciding who makes state finals, deciding who is a state medalist. Um, you know, these levels of detail, I think, are, are so critical on the achievement side. I, I think that uh, some of us think the content design is only 
only, oh, it's those people we pay a lot of money to that are going to get us there. They're a half of the equation. Mm -hmm. It's the students that really are bringing it to life. Do they continue to connect with the audience? Are they believable? Uh, that's another training element, but I love that the responsibilities, again, come back to the students. And, and you, you control this outcome as much as anyone. Bring the show to life. It's the expression on your face. It's how you're involved and you're playing that musical phrase all the way to the end. And uh, they, they can help with the design of the show as much as any, anyone else. Yeah, yeah. So let's watch a little clip where they talk about um, what, this, uh, what the achievement side looks like from a content and design judge perspective. And we've talked about this a little bit, the word role and what that means. I think sometimes people might confu get confused and think, oh, role, role means maybe one person's role, mm -hmm. like an actor or a soloist in the right. show. And I think role is just wherever the focus is, that, that's the role that we're talking about. So if it's a brass feature, are they sustaining the role of selling that brass feature musically and visually and is the color guard there to supplement what's going on and, and all of those things. So is, is the, uh, the role being sustained? Well, the role isn't always being played by the same people at the same time all the way through the show, but I guess number one would be, are you guiding us to where we should be paying attention, like the primary, secondary, tertiary kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Do we know where the primary focus is and are the students that are in that primary focus role sustaining that role? Are they performing at the highest level? Are they selling it? Are they crescendoing mm -hmm. to the end of the release? Like those little details that end up being the most massive part of what you're sure. doing. Um, is that happening at a high level from start to finish? Or are there lulls? Are there times where, and that could be, you know, maybe related to pacing, mm -hmm. but oftentimes you might, students might disengage a little bit and you can feel that as a judge or as an audience member when students are not fully extending through every moment of the choreography or, you know, committing to the marching style or committing musically to their fundamentals that they've learned and applying it to what they're playing, that's where I think sometimes directors are surprised that many of these things that we high, hold in such high regard in terms of excellence in marching and playing and choreography and guard work, that those things are what's creating the the magic on the content and design mm -hmm. sheet, right? And so that's the beauty of it is that that overlap is there. And yes, you need the, the vehicle and you need to give the students something to be successful with, but they could have the most brilliantly designed thing of all time by the best designers in the world. And if there's not buy-in and there's not a high level of achievement there, then that's not they're not sustaining their role. And right. we're not seeing that come across clearly. And you can't give credit on the right side of that sheet if that's happening. Mm -hmm. And I want to piggyback on that. Uh, he said, Dan said the word excellence, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what I'm looking for when I'm judging, mm -hmm. is I want the excellence to come to life mm -hmm. in the performance. That's huge, and you touched on all those great points, uh, but excellence is a huge thing on this side of the sheet, and uh, what kind of excellence are we talking about? Every kind of excellence, whatever mm -hmm. you're asking your performers to do, mm -hmm. musically or visually, or you know the color guard members, the electronics, whatever element of the production, you want excellence to be brought to life. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be state of the art sounds from the electronics, the fidelity, mm -hmm. great. State of the art movement from what you're asking the color guard to do, the body choreo, state of the art, everything. Mm -hmm. So you want the excellence to come to life to give credit here on the sheet. Another thing really quick that I want to touch on is again, do not get away from the audience. This is a huge thing. We have to have moments in the productions to allow the audience <coughs> to react. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of us have seen shows, or we've seen hundreds and hundreds of band shows through our years, and where there are uh, bands that forget about this, and they don't allow the audience to, you know, to react, to clap. Yeah, yeah. Do I clap? Wait a minute. Well, they didn't bring their instruments down. Right. They played a beautiful, sonorous G major chord with a horn line mm -hmm. out there. G made, but it There's was only- so many problems with <laughs> <laughs> but, but Wow, why would you do that? But go, but go ahead. Well, <laughs> let's just, you know, it was perfectly in tune. The top, the bottom, the third, it. everything was there. The fifth, it was a beautiful sounding G major chord, but it was only three counts. And mm -hmm. it was at quarter note equals 160. And then you went on to something else. Yeah. Instead of, a G major chord could be just glorious yeah. out there from the, from the ensemble. But, you know, give the audience a chance to react to that. Hold it right. out seven counts or nine counts or 11. Let it breathe. Let it, let breathe. it breathe. And then, mm -hmm. you know, let the audience and hold on to that chord. Give them a moment to react to it. 
Uh, and those seconds that you do are probably more valuable than anything you could have crammed in with eight more counts or whatever. Absolutely. You get, you get more, more bang for your buck. Yeah. And I think that when it comes to moments like that in production, sometimes we fall a little bit short. Here comes your big ta-da moment and ta-da, and you moved on to something really quick. And mm -hmm. you didn't let the audience savor that moment right. or react to it. And so I think that's also very important yeah. on this uh, here on this descriptor on Great. the sheet. I think there's different ways uh, to, one, sustain a role or communicate musical roles to the audience because not everything has to be loud. Mm -hmm. You can draw people in just as well with a single person, a single voice in the ensemble, um, even a down roll. I mean, if a person sits on the edge of their seat and they want more, that's still communication with the audience. Mm -hmm. So I think there's... That goes back to variety. Yes. Um, I also think that the way that you communicate to the audience with your performers and what you're asking them to do becomes really important because if they're not comfortable on the field, um, they're not going to be able to sell it. And so comfort, comfortability mm -hmm. in how they do what they do. And so that goes back to where we kind of talked about earlier. Hopefully the sheet will guide that process so you're not giving them, you know, you're not the Blue Devils. And so you shouldn't maybe put a snare drummer on a 20-foot ladder and try right. to play, you right. know. You, so, you be you. Yeah. 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 You do what's best for you. And and I think that's what we need to remember in this sheet. It's, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily, it's about your choices, but it's about your appropriateness of choices mm -hmm. for your group. Mm hmm I think we can train our students in anything they feel comfortable with. With uh, We see on the sheet, it talks about sustaining the role, but the word compelling. Mm -hmm. Are you compelling? And that, that doesn't mean it has to be just overly acted, for instance. But if I'm playing a musical phrase or visually portraying a phrase, I, I, do I come across as just like, wow, I really believe what they're selling. I can use the word believability. And then uh, being able to sustain that, you see initiation a lot of times where they can initiate a phrase and over the course of time or the course of the yeah. show arc, it's they're getting tired or mentally they're checking out and an audience kind of catches that. At adjudicators, we, we check that mm -hmm. and I think that we're trying to get that going. The word compelling, I love that word a lot. Mm -hmm. Are you compelling? Is the students, does it come across as a really, here's the emotion that it, that's visceral and we all have that or it's the subtlety of it. Does it come across as a very compelling moment? It's how we handle it with some other words that are on the sheet here and I always kind of come back to those words and it, and it sometimes helps me make the decision as a, as a judge. Okay, yeah. that's the difference maker with that one word, for instance. And I think another key on this sheet, which I think is pretty much on all of them, again, we'll hit, is professionalism. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. Because to me, the more the students are comfortable with the product, the more that professionalism just exudes from uh -huh. each performer. Again, yeah. how they walk on the field, how they present mm -hmm. themselves to the audience. Um, it's easier to do that if you're able to achieve what you've been given. Yeah. Re regardless of what that is, it mm -hmm. can be anything you want it to be. It's right. it's your show. Yeah, great thoughts from that panel. Just in talking about um, you know what the achievement side of content and design looks like, and um, having students understand. And I think I, I said this earlier with these state sheets. You, if you're teaching one A through four, if you're mentoring a group one A through four, encourage them to use these with their students, not on the content side, but on the achievement side, yeah. you know, cut out a little card, hand it to the trumpet section leader, hand it to the flute section leader, and, and then give them those five boxes on the bottom and say, where, do you, where does the section feel we score? Because that student and that individual accountability, as they're talking about there, that individual accountability, I think, matters so much. Thank you for the, the comments in the, uh, the uh, chat also. Several yeah. directors and several, several judges along the way have said, this is going to be great. We're going to do this every morning, uh, every Monday morning, and then we're going to use these as teaching tools. I think they're so valued. Any classification, anyone who has a performing ensemble. Yeah. Well, guys, we are getting into the end. We have one more clip that I thought, just in reviewing all the footage we took from the content and design panel that I thought was good, I wanted to share just a short little two-minute clip, and then we'll wrap up with our final quiz. Um, but uh, here's our last little content and design clip that I think has just some more good, valuable uh, advice for everybody. Here we go. That being said, mm -hmm. this is the one sheet that allows a judge to watch the show from beginning to end mm -hmm. and just react to mm -hmm. what they see. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll, I'll go back to a secret world again. I mean, you were constantly on the edge of your seat because the show evolved through time mm -hmm. musically and visually, and you were always looking for that next thing to happen. You mm -hmm. know, it was very well crafted. Mm -hmm. And this allows you to react to that, mm -hmm. you know, and still give you guidance on, mm -hmm. on 
always or mm -hmm. or usually or consistently or rarely, which we hope we don't see it. State. Exactly, yeah. especially at the state <laughs> level. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one last thing about this that, that uh, was great advice to me that I definitely like to give to everyone when judging from a content design sheet as opposed to an analysis sheet, I was digging really deep in analysis and I was yes. going for this. And the best advice someone gave me was let the show come to you. Mm -hmm. Take it in as audience member. Take it in as you have your your uh, box of popcorn and you're just kind of sitting there and going, you're enjoying this. And you're you you are kind of understanding, you're evaluating this, but were you were you affected by this as a person? Did that make sense or did you want more? Were you lacking more? Or like, wow, that was exactly the color I thought they were gonna come out with. And then that's the perfect end to the storyline, or it's an absolute abstract idea of like they kept the theme going the whole time I noticed look there's triangles everywhere and look there's the music's in three four time and you're just kind of enjoying it and you're taking it mm -hmm. in I had to learn to do that so I definitely wanted to give that that same uh, helpful advice to whoever was judging this let it come to you in this level and once I learned to do it from that viewpoint it definitely made it a lot easier to receive it rather than sort I'm going to go after it and start trying to uh, attack it a little mm -hmm. bit as yeah. a judge so the ability to react to what you see on the field yes. is so important because yeah. it goes back to the audience that's what the audience does yeah exactly uh, in many ways you are the most educated person in the audience and then you have to be <laughs> able to be affected towards that and, and lo love or hate it so. Awesome. Well, again, a great advice. Uh, and I know that that's saying, and I, and I, Mark was saying how he had repeated it about let the show come to you. I just, I think it's some of the best advice that we can share um, is, is for these folks to just, you know, let the show come to you as you're judging content and design, uh, see where it meets you. You are the most educated audience member there. Um, and so, you know, hopefully that, that helps you in your journey. Uh, of preparing. Well, I think that we have, uh, let me transition over, we've arrived at our final quiz. It's already in the chat. I did it right as that video was wrapping up. And this is the final of five quizzes. Um, starting uh, probably Monday morning, I'm going to email you one more time, just thanking you for coming to the training. I'm going to send you all five quizzes. Um, if you need them, I'll probably just go through and see if you need them rather than making you worry right. that you need to redo them. Right. Um, but I'll be checking in just to make sure that you've completed all of them if you're judging area. If you're missing one, don't worry. I'll send you an email with a link that just says, hey, I'm missing quiz three from you. Would you mind going back and taking this? And this video will be available if you go, oh, well, I worry I might need a quick review before I take it again. A-OK. -okay. This video will be posted up again, so you can go ahead and watch that right before it. I'm also going to, in the comment section of the video, once it posts or in the, the, the body of all the, where it talks a little bit about what's there, I'm going to post for you a little bit that reviews um, kind of where sections are. Where did they talk about mm -hmm. percussion? Where did they talk about, you know, area visual? And that way you can share it with staff members and they don't have to search through the whole the video. Yeah, yeah, you can share exactly what they need to see uh, so that they know exactly where to go. That's great. Um, but, but again, I want to thank all of you for joining us. This was our first time doing this. Um, and so it certainly it was kind of a reaction to the COVID situation we were in with trying to put a training together um, for UIL. And, and hopefully this, walking out of this, you feel more prepared. Uh, going into those rounds. We're going to be available to to answer your questions in the future. You can always email me. I'm, I'll speak for Mark. You can email him. Yes, please uh, do. Yeah, but but thank you all for joining us. you have any final thoughts? Well, on that? first of all, Jerry, thank you for all your technology uh, wizardry that you do here. So we, we talk about a lot of things and I'll have an idea and I'm like, okay, you know how to put that together, right? <laughs> so he's he's wonderful at, at putting all of this. So uh, kudos to your your hard work. Again, I want to thank the committee. We definitely want to thank Dr. Kent mm. and uh, Gabe Masella for all of your support along this, this long journey we've had so far uh, we, we know this this is going to be a great vehicle uh, we, we do want the judges to make sure you're planning our, our students deserve the best make sure you're bringing your best you're well rested the day you go to con your contest and you're reviewed your notes you have everything laid out and it's going to be great we're looking forward to this be a great jumping off point uh, for this season at the region level the area level and of course at the uh, state level that happens in early November. Yeah, and lastly, thanks to our panelists and all the great band directors who agreed and volunteered their time to, to offer this. This wasn't a, a paid gig for anybody. Yeah. This is all in, in the effort to grow and expand the programs here in Texas and make them better. And thank all of you for judging because by judging, you help grow those programs as well. So thanks everybody. I hope you have a great uh, rest of your Sunday and we look forward to seeing you down the road.